time having arrived for Monday, July 21st, 7 o'clock, I hereby call the Finance Committee meeting to order councils. Before we uh, start the agenda tonight, a couple uh, points of information. Uh, Personnel Director Maureen Cruz will not be in attendance tonight, along with Assessor Paul Sullivan. Both are on vacation this week. Superintendent of the Schools, Kathy Smith, unfortunately is ill tonight. She cannot join us, but uh, Assistant Superintendent Mike Thomas is here. Uh, and then also I was notified that Aquaria will not be joining us tonight. We found out on Friday that the uh, principal is abroad traveling, uh, and we will address that resolve. Since it's my resolve, I'm going to have them come in next month. Uh, one other thing, Council, since we're in summer session, we haven't been together in a while. hope everyone's having a good summer. Unfortunately, uh, Fire Chief uh, Francis, Richard Francis, lost his mom since the last time we were here. So out of respect for the chief and his family, I'd like to uh, take a moment of silence. Thank you, Councils. Councils, another point of information. Um, as you know, we received correspondence from the mayor, and I'm going to read it. Uh, it's attention to me, Council President Robert Sullivan. It's dated July 15th. Dear Council President Sullivan, notice of a special meeting. Please be advised there will be a special city council meeting on Wednesday, two nights from today, uh, July 23rd, 2014, at 7 p.m. here in the Council Chamber's second floor of City Hall. And in the purpose is executive session. Uh, relative to pending litigation matters. So, councilors, we are having a special city council meeting here at two nights. Hopefully, everybody can attend. One other thing, councilors, um, I uh, invited tonight in my capacity as uh, council president, but more, and for, uh, more importantly, as a councilor at large, two gentlemen, uh, two Brocktonians, two really esteemed uh, guests here tonight uh, Anthony Onis, Attorney Anthony Onis, and Mr. John P. Tolan. Jack and Tony served the city well, very, very well. Jack for 27 years, and Tony, believe it or not, for 25 years on the ZBA. Uh, to my disappointment and dismay, uh, their names were not put forward this year for reappointment, but I think we uh, have to recognize them, we owe it to them, and more importantly, we want to thank them. 25 years and 27 years of unpaid volunteerism. So, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals was served extremely well with these gentlemen, their skill sets, their experience, and uh, they, they will not be replaced. We have a citation, City of Brockton, official citation. Be it known that the Brockton City Council hereby extends its congratulations to Mr. Anthony Ionis Esquire in recognition of your respective dedication, diligence, and service to the City of Brockton as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals for over 25 years. And be it further known that the City Council extends its best wishes for continued success, that this citation be duly signed by myself as President of the Council and attested to, and a copy therefore transmitted by the City Clerk, Anthony Zioli. It's offered by the entire collective City Council, dated today, July 21st, 2014. We also have a, another official citation, City of Brockton, be it known that the Brockton City Council hereby extends its congratulations to Mr. John P. Toland in recognition of your respective dedication, diligence, and service to the City of Brockton as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals for over 25 years. And be it further known that the City Council extends best wishes for continued success, that the citation is duly signed by myself, Robert Sullivan, President of the City Council, and attested to by the City Clerk, Anthony Zioli. And this too is offered, Jack, collectively by the City Council. Tony, Jack, thank you very, very much. Councilors, thank you for that. And again, Mr. Tolan, Attorney Jonas, thank you for all that you have done and will continue to do to better the city of Brockton. Thank you, gentlemen. With that being said, uh, I also, Councilors, before we move into the agenda item, I received a certified letter and I traveled down to the main post office to sign for it. Robert Sullivan, Council President, it's a correspondence. Uh, dear Mr. Sullivan, I, Ron Matta, as a resident, homeowner, and taxpayer in the city of Brockton, 
Hereby formally requested I be invited to speak in the front of the City Council. The topic to be discussed will be the desalinization contract, the plant, and what effect it has on the City, its citizens, and economy. Ron Matta, uh, 29 Brea Street, which is in Ward 3, Council of Aries, uh, and his phone number and its sign and its dated as such. Councilors, I will, uh, when it's appropriate, entertain a motion. If anybody objects to that, then we have to follow Robert's rules. I did explain to Mr. Uh, Mr. Matter that uh, he would be able to speak before the council. Of course, I'm only one of 11, so we'd have to take a vote on it. But it wouldn't be tonight, councillors. It would be at the next FinCom meeting. The next FinCom meeting, um, we would do that at that time. So I will entertain that at the end of the evening. Madam Clerk, if we could go to number one, please. Appointment. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Madam Clerk. I received the correspondence. I apologize on that. Councilors, I received the correspondence from uh, City Clerk just five minutes ago. Uh, it's from uh, Bill Coppinger, Mayor of the City of Brockton. Uh, Mr. Zioli, please be advised that I am withdrawing the name of David M. Offutt for consideration for the Board of Cemetery Trustees for a five-year term. I'm going to entertain a motion to accept this correspondence and withdraw. So moved. Oh, second. Second. Motion made, properly second, to accept this correspondence and withdraw. Agenda item number one. All in favor, please raise your hands. I'll oppose. It's accepted. It's placed on file, and we are going to withdraw number one. Madam Clerk, number two, please. Appointment Robert May of 220 School Street, Apartment 2, Somerville, to the position of Director of Planning and Economic Development for the City of Brockton for a five-year term ending June 2019. Invited Robert May. Mr. May, good evening. Good evening, Mr. President. Thank you for Councilors. being here tonight. We appreciate that. Thank you for the opportunity. Do you have a statement for us? I do not have an opening statement. Um, however, I am um, excited to be here in the city of Brockton. I look forward to answering the questions that you have and to working with the community to um, advance Brockton over the next few years. Thank you, sir. Councils. Council Dubois, you have Hello, the floor. Hello, welcome. Congratulations on your new job, uh, Mr. May. Could you just please give us a background of your experience and what makes you qualified for the position? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I have over 20 years of experience in community and economic development um, from uh, anywhere in the Midwest. Uh, Chicago is where I grew up. Uh, most recently, I was with the city of Somerville and uh, where I was Director of Economic Development. In the city of North Chicago, Illinois, I was Director of Community Development, which includes planning and, econ and uh, all general economic development activities. Great, that's wonderful. And so how long were you in Somerville? I was in Somerville for a little over four years. And what, what drew you to this position? What I find exciting about Brockton, being a gateway community, being a urban center in and of itself, the opportunity to really come in to work with uh, the resident population, the businesses, the elected officials, to create a plan for the future of the community and to then help implement that plan and bringing different resources to bear um, in, in fulfillment of that plan. What experience, and if, there, if you don't have direct experience with this, like what's your, um, your goals around um, working with communities that are kind of um, used to be manufacturing hubs and really haven't made that jump to properly zoning their communities for um, the way the area has changed? As an example, I have an area that's known uh, as the village used to be the Lithuanian village, and it has a lot of industrial and commercial in it, right up against residential zones, because uh, factories back in the day, before zoning, mm -hmm. were allowed to build you know, uh, multifamily homes for their workers, and as you go up the hill, the multifamilies turn into single families, and then it was a pine forest, which is now um, Brookfield and Ashfield. But my, I would like to see um, cottage-style homes replace that industrial zone because it's right off of a communal rail um, spot. So what is your experience when you're looking at um, an urban community that has zoning that's antiquated where um, it's, developed, it's zoned for commercial or industrial, but in reality, it's a residential zone now? Have you had any experience with that? Uh, yes, Counselor. <coughs> Pardon me. You're fine. Loud. Um, my experience is is directly that uh, it's working in older, um, mixed income, uh, 
mixed race communities where um, the previous manufacturing uh, economy, uh, as we all know, has, has picked up and moved. Uh, in some places, we work to preserve what we have there um, because we need those jobs, we need that tax base. In other places uh, where we, we would work with the community to um, really create a vision of what their neighborhood is supposed to be or, or, or would like to be in the, in the future. And where zoning needs to be uh, improved, uh, that's certainly something that I have experience in writing new zoning. Um, I was working uh, most directly, most recently uh, at the city of Somerville, we wrote, rewrote the Union Square zoning, uh, which allowed for um, more dense urban infill development uh, that is adjacent to a, a new Green Line uh, rapid transit station that's coming to the community. We have three very um, well-served uh, transit nodes here in Brockton, and I think that there's an opportunity to build on those, both residential and commercial development, yep. uh, bringing jobs, office jobs, first floor retail with, with space up above. So there, there is, um, opportunity here. There is certainly a trend within the United States to see reurbanization. Uh, we have more and more people moving back into the urban core. Those are good things. They bring with them money um, and tax revenue uh, and new ideas and vibrancy to our communities. Um, but we need to have the plan to deal with this increase uh, um, and, and reuse of the property so that we don't you know, have head butting um, and some of the problems that you might see in, in other communities. But it, it really focuses back on working with the residents, working with the businesses, working with the elected officials to create a plan that, that is representative of everyone and then moving that plan forward. So when you were in Chicago, did and I'm sorry that I'm not sure what community it was, there was recently um, this big program I watched about a community in Chicago that had a large influx of low-income um, folks move into their uh, more or less residential community and they embraced that community and have been having really great strides and making sure that the property values don't plummet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the, the study was done by uh, an Afri African American uh, think tank uh, and it showed that in a community that has over 40% African Americans all the way across the nation, it has higher um, air pollution and lower property values. Um, and this community in Chicago has found a way to fight that. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? I, I haven't seen that study, okay. um, but uh, when I was in Chicago working with the Chicago Association of Neighborhood Development Organizations, which acronym is Can Do. No groans, please. Um, <laughs> we were basically, we were an association of neighborhood groups. We didn't work for the city. We worked for, for the uh, groups that were on the ground doing those sorts of things. And so um, we were very involved in, in retail revitalization of the old commercial strips. We were also involved in industrial, in industrial revitalization in uh, what we called planned manufacturing districts. Yep where we tried to hold the line on gentrification so that we can keep those good paying jobs here. But it would be very interesting to see that report and, and if, if you have a chance, if you find it. I'll shoot it over to you. I, I would appreciate yeah. that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council Bonds. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. May, nice to meet you. Uh, just a question here, in your resume it said that you co-wrote the study uh, on investment in wa uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. Uh, and economic development, and that it focused on a lot of the, the water, I guess, transportation issues on the eastern uh, part of Massachusetts. Can you just, n not to ambush you, but can you maybe talk about how, what you found in that study, how you, you're going to implement that here with some of our water issues here in Brockton? Uh, yes, Counselor. Um, while I was and I still am, with the University of Massachusetts, uh, Boston, at the uh, Edward J. Collins Center for Urban, or for, um, um, policy, is it? pardon me? Is it public policy? For pu public management, yes. Um, stage fright. <laughs> uh, we were hired by the uh, Massachusetts Water um, Resource Authority uh, to look into, um, first, the academic literature that linked 
Um, is there a, a relationship between the expansion of water and wastewater utilities with urban or with with development, mm -hmm. which there was a strong correlation, although none of the papers could really show causation, but it, it, it's kind of there. Um, next, we um, inventoried and, and really analyzed the situation in eastern Massachusetts with the new SWIMI regulations, which is the surface water management SWMI initiative uh, that the state has, or the Commonwealth has, excuse me, um, where they have um, been analyzing both groundwater, um, surface water, and, and groundwater um, aquifers to determine what the safe draw would be um, to allow for human and industrial and agricultural uses and also to maintain the delicate ecosystem that we live here. Uh, live with here. Um, as you know, there are places in Massachusetts where, where we've overbuilt and there's just no water. If you're in the Ipswich River Valley, um, it's a real desperate situation up there where they exceed their annual draw and if there were to be a drought, they would be into some serious troubles. In eastern Massachusetts, or southeastern Massachusetts, we don't have a lot of surface water impoundments, reservoirs like other parts of the state have, and we rely pretty much on groundwater. Um, it, groundwater is a little bit harder to um, analyze, but um, because of the geography, um, we have interconnected aquifers, and community A could be drawing a larger amount of water than is, is um, required, and that's kind of sucking out underneath the other communities. So. Long story short, I'm sorry, if there is additional growth in southeast Massachusetts, which there will be, and if there were some environmental hazards and problems, either through um, uh, lack of precipitation or increasing um, changes in weather patterns, there could be a um, severe water shortage in, in southeast Massachusetts that would then potentially set up communities that have access to water, um, could set up opportunities for them to be able to sell water. Now, this is a, a longer range plan. Um, I'm swinging at it in the dark from right now, um, but there are opportunities, and I know people are looking at uh, Regional Water Authority or whether uh, Brockton should buy its water plant back um, there are a couple of different options that, that should be looked at, but I guess the answer, the quick answer to the question, with a quick wrap up, is that there will be opportunities um, for water usage and, and water sales in the future. I don't know when, but yes, there will be. Okay, and thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate you um, articulating that and hitting on all those points. Um, also, too, it mentioned uh, in your resume that you secured some funding um, for the Department of Transportation and some other kinds of things. How much would you say, you know, over your, your time in uh, Illinois, federal and state, just would you say? How much time? No, how much um, funding did you secure for the area? I would say it's in the millions, um, whether it's from the Economic Development Administration, um, we, we still have active counties in, in Illinois um, because there's unincorporated land, <laughs> so using grants from the county, grants from the state, um, creating a multi-layered um, approach to development and getting projects done, uh, whether it's an open grade crossing of a railroad track that we needed to um, secure to allow new access to a, a Navy base and get those dollars being spent in our community or, or working with EPA to do um, brownfield analysis and remediation of a older industrial site that is now um, uh, available for redevelopment. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Constance, we're taking a one minute recess.
Thank you, Councils. We're back in the session. Thank you, sir. Mr. President. Mr. Monahan. Councilor Monahan. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Main. Congratulations on your appointment. Councilor. Um, <clears throat> As myself and Council Denapoli covered the, most of the downtown, and we just recently hired, or the B21 just hired a downtown manager. Um, what is your vision for the development of the downtown? We've got Trinity uh, project going in now. We're talking about possibly uh, some colleges coming downtown. What's your vision for downtown? What's your plan for downtown? And working with the downtown manager. Well, first of all, I can say that, you know, as, as a, a professional planner, um, one of our traits is as we drive down a street or something like that, you know, it, it, it's always in the back of my head that, oh, we could do this here, we could do this here, and, and I can do that to any community. And yes, I have some ideas on, on what could happen, but first and foremost, I, I would like to get the community together, um, business owners, property owners, residents, elected officials again, to help create that vision and then implement that. I would like to see additional development downtown. Um, that's my personal um, feeling. Um, I, I think that there is opportunity to bring new anchor institutions into downtown uh, and, and certainly more uh, commercial development and uh, more storefront development over time. Uh, there's a lot of lots and um, properties that are available for infill development and reutilization. <coughs> Um, sometimes you'll see uh, first floors that are being occupied, but second and third floors are sitting empty. Uh, there's uh, other blocks um, that there is absolutely no activity um, that I've been able to see in the short time that I've been touring the city. But um, as I said, there is development potential down here, um, especially because of the rail um, access and being able to get to downtown uh, Boston in 30 minutes into the financial district. Um, that's very important. Um, the educational assets that are down in this area um, and the natural resources that are just within walking distance practically of, of downtown really bode well for making it a 18-hour a community where there's office jobs, retail opportunities, uh, places to eat and drink, and places to live. And, uh, and I'm probably unfair of me to ask you these questions because you're just <laughs> jumping in here. But I don't know if you're aware of the vacant buildings that the city does own downtown and any plans that you would see for those, obviously the same thing, probably development as far as, uh, as I don't think we need much more residential downtown. I think we're sort of booked up with that. But um, what, is, what do you think it, your um, job will be as far as working with the downtown manager? Well, there, there's three main groups that I would want to work with right off the bat. Well, four maybe. Um, that's Brockton 21, uh, 21st Century. There is the Brockton Redevelopment um, Authority and the Downtown uh, Association. And when you look at the groups, or excuse me, you look at the properties that are available downtown, um, a lot of them bode themselves well for new or, or reused commercial opportunities. Um, I, I think that there's a great opportunity to have some sort of incubator here, um, and there's a growing um, uh, trend towards what they call a fab lab, fabrication laboratory, and they, they were really created out of MIT, and we've had some experience when I was with um, Somerville in creating a, a fab lab there that's called the um, Art, um, Arts Annex. Um, and uh, the, the basic idea of a fab lab is, is your father's workshop on steroids. And it's got all the tools. And, and after people join for a modest amount of money, take classes, uh, and use this equipment to rapid prototype, um, or, or even if it's just a hobby ac activity. Um, but mostly it's, it's about creating new products, prototyping products, uh, and, and getting a foot up. Uh, in the market, and I think that there's that kind of initiative here in Brockton. You look at the, all the manufacturers that we have here, the uh, immigrant community that's chosen to come to, to, to Brockton, uh, looking for opportunities to create new businesses, to, uh, to create new products, um, <coughs> grow, create jobs, and eventually export products. Okay, well, thank you very much. I uh, hope that answered, Councillor. Yes, very good, thank you. Councillor Stewart, followed by Councillor Cruz. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. May, good to see you. Glad that you are uh, before us. You'll be, you'll be happy to know that we've already actually started uh, work on a fab lab or a, a oh, making sir. lab um, here in, in the downtown area. And we're just starting to get that off the ground with an initial investment to do a planning process and grant for it. Uh, and my colleagues here have, helped, have uh, been involved in helping me get that started uh, with the mayor and others. Uh, we're naming it Big Bang, and it's really focused on youth making, so youth entrepreneurship and the making of products in, in that way. So I'm happy that we're on the Excellent. same page with that, which I think is important. Um, so I look at your resume and I see more of an economic uh, development person than I see a, a planner. And so I wanted to ask some questions about your planning experience and some of the choices you've made, just so I have, been, have a better understanding of where your interest lies. So um, I see that your degree, you have an MBA, Yes, sir. Um, you've done some additional sort of post-graduate um, work in terms of a certificate, but it's also economic development. So is there a reason why you decided not to do more um, urban planning, um, formal educational work in urban planning? I grew up in um, Northwest Indiana, which is a very industrialized um, community. Gary, Indiana, um, major steel producer. Whiting, Indiana is, is a major oil um, uh, refining area. And um, economic development, job creation, those are, you know, at my core, very, very important activities. But they are just the, the tip of a, of, of a iceberg, if you will, of, of disciplines that we have to bring to the table that, that we call planning. And if you look at some of the things that I've done in the city of Gary, Indiana, or in um, Chicago, where, and, and in North Chicago, Illinois, where we've done um, major community development plans, uh, tax increment finance, which in, in Illinois is tax increment finance, and in Massachusetts it's DIF. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's creating plans, administering and developing urban renewal plans, uh, where I've done that here in, in Somerville and in North Chicago. Um, in North Chicago, I was also the uh, zoning administrator. So we were, I was responsible for reviewing all the projects that came across the desk to make sure that they were uh, in compliance with the zoning code before they were handed off to the building department. Um, I also spent time uh, writing new zoning code, where I've done that here in uh, Somerville uh, with their uh, Union Square zoning and uh, developing the comprehensive plan for the city of Somerville. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can certainly tell you have the practical experience for planning. I was just curious why you haven't pursued it in an, acad in an academic fashion. Um, I chose to pursue a, um, a master's in business administration because at the time I felt that it would provide me with opportunities beyond just limiting myself to the planning field. As, um, as people advance through this industry, um, there are good people who do planning day after day, and, and that's very important. Um, but planning, again, is one of the disciplines that we have to bring to the table to, to move the community forward. And so I have a background and can do um, work in finance, in marketing, sales, promotions, um, accounting work. Those are all skills that we have to bring um, to management of a, of a municipal department. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that my practical experience in planning uh, does speak for itself. Mm -hmm. and um, will be an important asset to the community. Okay, fair enough. I, I'm pressing on this because it, it concerns me a bit. I think we probably can all agree that when there's a dearth of planning for over a decade in the city, and so having a planner in place to really lead that work so that you're not serving multiple masters is a concern um, because I think it, that this role really deserves uh, someone who's really concentrated on planning, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, you mentioned earlier you wanted to hold the line on gentrification. So can you, what is, what's your stance on, on gentrification? In, in Chicago, Councillor, mm -hmm. where um, we worked in creating what, what's called the Model Industrial Corridor uh, Program, where we worked with, um, we were able to get funding from the city of Chicago to work with local neighborhood groups who were um, 
they called themselves Local Industrial Retention Initiative Leary Program. Um, their job was to work with the local businesses uh, to understand their needs for transportation, security, access to workers, um, a myriad of, of activities. And in Chicago, there are um, strong um, sectors, uh, strong neighborhoods that, that are, are, are very um, uh, entrenched in manufacturing. And, and when a factory may fail, real estate developers like to jump right in and, and turn it into loft condos and, and make millions of dollars. But mm -hmm. that may be very good for them. It may not be the best thing for the community and for the city at large. And so those are the things that we have to balance as we move forward. Um, a little bit of growth um, managed over time, those are good things but we don't want to cut off the base underneath the, uh, which we stand on, which are the industrial and um, commercial properties that are here in the city that, that pay taxes and help us have better schools, better security, better mm -hmm. parks and recreation. Okay. So, so you're not necessarily opposed to gentrification as long as, it is, as long as it's Strategic and managed well is what I'm hearing from you. Uh, Councilor, strategic, managed well, and there is an opportunity um, it, to do um, uh, growth without displacement. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's an opportunity for uh, large portions of the population to all participate in Brockton becoming even better than it is. Right. So in, in the previous positions that you've held, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the planning staff that you worked with or who worked underneath you and what that looked like? Uh, in the city of Somerville, I had five full-time planners that worked uh, under me, plus two, uh, excuse me, three uh, historic preservation planners. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't play it up much in the resume, but I do have a, an extensive <coughs> background in historic preservation. Uh, in the city of um, North Chicago, I had a staff of, of five and um, was responsible for everything from how high my, can, can I build my fence to um, managing the CDBG Community Development Block Grant Program and doing housing rehabilitation and, and activities like that. So um, there's a myriad of, of mm -hmm. experience there. Um, at uh, Can Do, I had um, three staff members working for me. So um, I've run the gamut from small to large, uh, our, our moderate size development. Um, if you were to go to Cambridge or, or to Boston, they have much larger mm -hmm. uh, planning staffs. But um, I do have the experience to be able to do it all. Um, there is a lot of work that needs to be done here in Brockton. Um, and it's going to take us some time, but together, um, pulling together resources, whether it's, it's B21, um, the Redevelopment uh, Authority, a university or two, um, Old Colony, you know, if, if, if we have a strategy and we're all moving forward to create that vision, I think that that's something that we can accomplish. So, and then tell me a little bit more about your technical planning skills. I, I ask that question because, um, you know, you're working with a one or two person team, at least in the planning office, and uh, there are some very concrete planning skills that we need that can't be formed off to a team of people who can help you put together documents. So can you just be more, exactly. and I don't see it in your resume, which it probably shouldn't be in the resume at this level, but be more explicit about what your planning skills are what tools you can use, what, what you have experience in, in implementing as you build out um, plans? There's some major roles that the uh, Director of Planning and Economic Development here in Brockton will play. Uh, the first is providing uh, support to the planning board as it um, uh, initiates the comprehensive planning process. Uh, the second is, is really working with the board on smaller um, projects in the community and whether that's going out and running community meetings, uh, developing surveys, those are all things I have experience with. The other uh, interesting f uh, opportunity here is um, with subdivision uh, regulations and um, it is up to the planning board to uh, approve uh, subdivision um, subdivisions of property mm -hmm. and um, 
those are things that I'll also be uh, participating and commenting on and, and providing um, guidance. Can you tell me more about your mastery of specific planning tools and software? Um, I have used uh, uh, ArcView mm -hmm. GIS, and I've been actually experimenting with um, the city's uh, GIS on the on the web page, which is a, a very slimmed down version of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I am fairly good at at creating new maps and and um, creating um, presentations. Okay, so and you say you are you've um, so are you proficient at it? Highly skilled at it? What's your level of expertise and that software and anything else that's relevant. I, I'm counselor. I'm fairly um, fairly proficient at creating maps and diagrams in in um, JS and in um, X, or, uh, Excel. Okay. Uh, and then, what sort of planning process do you subscribe to? So, a project, a possibility comes your way. Just walk me through your your process of getting it from concept to. Um, actually being real, I guess. Well, if it's a project that conforms with the community's vision, it conforms with the comprehensive plan that the community has helped create and that this um, board has, has approved, um, it, it's then something that, that we can spend um, much more time in, and um, deliberation trying to move forward. I think that the planning process has to be very open and transparent. We need to be meeting with the mayor, be meeting with the appropriate um, counselors, uh, it, especially it, if it's a project that's involved in a particular ward. Um, we need to be working very closely with community leaders who are not necessarily elected but still represent specific communities, whether it's, it's the, the Cape Verdean population or um, the handicapped community, um, the arts community, whatever that may be. Um, but again, it's a very open process. It's bringing all the people to the table that we can. Um, it, if it's something that's um, uh, um, you know, private at, at the very beginning, I can, I can understand those things, but there are key people who need to be informed of, of the process along the way. I don't like to, you know, would never want to be in a situation where I come up before either the planning board or this, or this body and say, I have something to, to, you know, drop on the table without ever having briefed anybody mm -hmm. uh, in the process. Great. Uh, so we've done, since I've been on the council, we've done a number of public forums and charrettes around what people would like to see in the city. So I'm, a, I'm assuming you'll have access to whatever those different reports are. I, I can remember explicitly two of those kinds of exercises taking place. Um, so as a new planner, what do you do with what's already been done versus trying to move forward? Like how do we capture and make use of the information that's already been gathered? Um, Councilor, there is a... Um Momentum, I would say, already heading um, in the positive direction down at, at Campello, uh, where Urban Land Institute was in a couple of years, ago, a year, year and a half ago, um, and, and put together a plan. And I know that that I've read online that that business district is very interested in, in becoming involved in furthering those plans. Um, I think that those are very good places to start where you have those mom that momentum, where you have some ideas already on the ground, and to build on those things. I don't think that we would come into a situation where a community has, um, say, we want to go in this direction, pardon me, and, and you know, completely start the whole process over again um, unless the community agreed or there was some serious flaw that we had to um, bring back to the community for their consideration. Okay. Uh, so two more questions. Uh, the city's biggest challenge and biggest opportunity based on what you've seen so far. Biggest challenge, I think, um, is growing out of this, sh this shadow of, of being a um, uh, a, a neglected or an overlooked community. I, I think that over the last five years or longer, there has not been a community planner, 
and um, we've had some projects that come you know, to fruition, but um, there's not a clear direction. And I, and I think that we need to have a clear direction so that the community believes in the future, that the business community believes in that future, and that makes it much easier for us to then sell Brockton to, to investors, to, to people who are going to bring new jobs to the community. The greatest opportunity, I think that when you look at um, the area around the three train stations, an opportunity to, to see new reinvestment there. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're marvelous opportunities. Uh, there's also some older mill buildings that are um, underutilized, and some not used at all, that um, could see some activity if we have a plan and a focus on what we want to do with those. Mm -hmm and not just wait for the market to react. Mm -hmm. uh, and before my last question, you had me think of something else. So around, for example, the Montello train station, which I think there's some prime opportunity there, would you promote the use of eminent domain to put in action a plan that has community buy-in? Well, I would like to first develop a plan uh, with the community and um, you know, create that vision and, and, and in a district that um, uh, that that's really a block by block plan and what we would like to see and, and where and what kinds of activities, how high, things like that. If, um, if there's an opportunity and the council uh, was so um, um, inclined to be able to use DIF or to be able to use urban renewal mm -hmm. um, to, to catalyze a project or two, um, you know, that would certain, those are the certain, um, uh, certainly the tools that we have as planners and developers here in Massachusetts, and, and that is at, at the council's uh, pleasure. But at your recommendation, typically. So philosophically, that's something that you would, if it were appropriate, you would support. If it's appropriate, yes. Um, but I'm not just a, a wholesale, let's tear up a neighborhood. Right. Uh, we've all seen what it's done to the uh, West End in Boston and, and in other communities where it's just been an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. So my last uh, question is, uh, and I've actually read some of the pieces that you produced um, based on what was listed in, in your resume. I'm a little skeptical, I wouldn't say highly skeptical, but a little skeptical about voting in favor of your uh, appointment to this position because it's also five years and I feel like this is a really important role. So I would ask you, based you know, for someone who's a little skeptical, um, what would be your your selling point here to me to vote in favor of your your appointment. I think I can um, easily or honestly say I know all the pieces that need to get done. I have the contacts um, in the state um, from my previous experience, uh, whether it's working with the Mass Planners Association or um, you know all the way down to uh, Mass Office of Business Development. Um, we know what needs to get done here. It's a matter of getting out, meeting the people. I'm very out and open in the community. Um, I'm not going to be sitting behind a desk all day. I like to get out and meet people. I'll be at night meetings. I'll be at events. Um, I'll be available to um, the counselors um, almost 24 hours. Don't put that in the notes. Um, you heard that, right, counselors? <laughs> I'm calling it five. Almost, almost. Um, <laughs> But my style is to be in the trenches and, and to work with people and to identify the issues that we all have and to move forward with those things. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you Mr. President. Thank you, Council. Council Cruz. Uh, thank you. Actually, Council Stewart hit a lot of what I was wanted to kind of ask you about much more eloquently than I would have. So uh, <laughs> uh, North Chicago, how big a t city is North Chicago? North Chicago is a community of 35,000 people. It is um, approximately 40% African American, 40% Hispanic, and the remainder of um, a white and an ethnic white uh, background. Economically kind of comparable to where we are? or Extremely comparable. So you, that's where your, your biggest planning experience has been? And then one of the things that you just kind of alluded to is maybe your connections because we need a lot of outreach to get this done. I mean, we don't have five 
five junior planners. We don't have, uh, you know, we don't have anybody. <laughs> we have Pam for right now. But uh, um, you, you feel like you can do that? You know, I've heard you manage that kind of stuff, and that's a, that can be quite a different thing than uh, actually having to go out and, and do most of that. Did you have that kind of staff in North Chicago also? Uh, in North Chicago, we had a staff of five, but they were involved in um, everything from uh, community rehabilitation. Uh, the, most were involved in, in CDBG administration. Um, so Which won't be those are activities now. that are all being done by the Redevelopment Authority. <coughs> Um, so I was responsible for the planning, the zoning, the creating new districts, um, administering the, the zoning ordinance, creating new um, zoning districts and, and updating the zoning map. Um, also the marketing, the outreach, um, I'm a, I'm a one-man band. Um, so I have the experience doing those activities and, and I know I can bring that expertise here to Brockton. And if you were approved, you know, next Monday night would be the final. Um, what do you see, what would be your first, uh, what do you see is the, the first thing you need to do taking over the job? Uh, the first thing I need to do um, is um, have a nice long sit down um, with, with Pam. Uh, she's done an, an excellent job um, keeping the office running. Um, she has incredible uh, institutional experience and um, really should be you know, commended. But um, one of the things that I want to do is, is start bringing together a series of partners because we can't do this all ourselves. And whether it's working with um, uh, Bridgewater um, or working with UMass Boston or the Kennedy School or MIT, uh, it's working with um, old Colony Planning, the uh, Metro South Chamber. It's, it's bringing everybody to the table. Um, I, um, I remember this fable when I was growing up that uh, we called it you know, stone soup. You have a gentleman who comes to town and you know, he's looking for something to eat. Oh, I'm well fed at the moment. Um, but he, he goes to the first house and, you know, the first person says, I, you know, don't want to invite you in. I've only got carrots. Goes to the next house. I only have onions. I'm sure you know the, the story. And at the end, he's, he's boiling this water. And everybody eventually comes in and has something to contribute to that. Um, that's kind of my philosophy on, on planning is that uh, we need to bring those people, all those people into the planning process because everybody has something to contribute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. you Council. Council Yaneri, followed by Council Azak. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, uh, Mr. May. Good evening, sir. And welcome. And I appreciate the fact that you um, applied for uh, this position uh, to be our uh, Director of Economic Development and Planning. Um, and I feel um, that over the last five or six years, and I think you've hit this point already, but I think over the last five or six years, we lost a lot here in the city of Brockton when past administration saw it differently um, to revitalize the, to revitalize or to rehab the planning department. And at that point, we lost the our city planner. And at that point, I, I feel the city of Brockton lost a lot when, when that happened. Um, because I don't think people have been paying enough attention to the city of Brockton for, for what it has here to offer and for bringing business in. I've always been a great believer. And, um, and I think I, I feel that a little bit somewhat in the new administration that you have to go out there and bring people, you know, to knock on your door so you can get some people in here to, you know, be the business partners that you, you want to be. So hopefully um, with you in place, we're going to be able to do some, you know, some of these other things that haven't been done over the last uh, several years. Um, I don't have many, many questions. I guess the only question I would, would have before I make a few comments is the fact that obviously you understand our residency law, so that means you'd be re relocating to the city of Brockton, correct? Uh, that is correct, and I've already, you know, inquired about a couple of um, opportunities to, to live here. Great, because every place in the city of Brockton is, is great, so if you, if you even want to locate to Ward 3, I'll, I'll definitely help you find a place down there as well, so love to have you there. I've got a there. 3 and I've got a 6. Do we have anybody over here? <laughs> We've got an 8 over here. In any case, <laughs> in any case, um, I know discussion's been centered uh, a lot as it uh, always has uh, around our downtown area and uh, no doubt um, we all feel that we need to be doing other things than, than what's been done 
through the downtown and as uh, as you know and and we have here this evening our new downtown uh, uh, manager um is uh, is here as well and and i know you'll be working with him and and uh, gary and i were graduates of brockton high school back in 1972 and i uh, went to school with him so i i feel um you know high confidence in what he's going to try to do to um to help uh, move things forward in the city as well i think the one thing that we need to do downtown and the other way it's going to turn downtown around is, and I've been saying it for 30 some odd years, is you need two-way traffic. And in order to get the two-way traffic back in the city, that's the plus that we need. And hopefully that's going to happen. I think there's some uh, uh, monies there that are going to be coming to the city so that we can start to, you know, move it in that direction. That's the biggest plus that we need to make sure that downtown uh, um, can be turned around. But at the same token, we have a couple other sections of the city that I'm concerned with. As you know, there's a Montello Businessmen's Association, and, and there's some small businesses up in that section of the city, if you're not familiar with that, going north into Maine and Montello in that area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of vacant buildings up there that need to be um, looked at. You know, hopefully some other businesses will come in and look at it as well and maybe purchase, which we hope. At the same token, you already mentioned South Side, which is Campello, uh, which I share, um, and Council Stadinsky also shares from Wadpool. We both share the Campello section of the city, and uh, it, it's a great little town down there, as we call it. It really, really is. Post office, drugstore, eateries, um, great Italian food down there as well. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good things down there, and uh, hopefully we can capitalize on, on what uh, you know, the state did when they came out a couple of years ago and um, try to make that go even further. And I know Gary is very um, close to that section of the city and has that in his heart as well. I mean, those are the things that I'm looking at. Um, to ask you questions about your resume, why would I? It's very impressive, very impressive. I, I think you're, you know, you're one that can handle this position. I, I think you're going to come in and you do an outstanding job. I, I think the best way to, to get going is, you know, get out there, get your feet on the ground and get going. And whenever I, as a city council, I'm sure any councils, you know, want to sit down and meet uh, with you, I'd love to do that just to share some thoughts and ideas with you. But, um, you know, I, I, think it's, I think you're a great fit, and uh, you definitely have my support when your name comes before me next week. So appreciate it, and thank, thank you. you sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Rezac, you all set? Good evening, Mr. May. Um, Councilor Ian Airy already asked my question. It was about residency, so welcome to Brockton. <laughs> That's it. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. May. Thank you very much. We did the quick switch. Yeah. My back was <laughs> uh, One of the, uh, the things, first of all, thank you for being here, your, your experience. I looked at your resume. It's, it's very impressive. I think a lot of the uh, more senior city councilors have for years have been, been asking for a planner. I mean, we're a city in the Commonwealth, a major city in the Commonwealth without a planner. It's, it's a big void since Nancy Stack Savoy left many, many years ago. One of the things the city council adopted was chapter 40R, smart, smart growth zoning. Yes, sir. And we have five uh, designated zones in the core of the downtown area. Uh, being from Somerville and, and understanding Boston and the like, what, what's your familiarity with smart growth zoning and how do you think that um, we can capitalize on that? I mean, there are some, some huge major financial investments going on in the core. Uh, Trinity Financial and the like. Um, Vincentes, which I'm sure you're aware of, it's a, it's a natural expansion. $3 million expansion uh, going up to... Uh, Turned around, that's south, it's up there. Going up that way. The, the market. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's actually in the last corridor of, of the, uh, the fifth zone. So could you just uh, kind of, and I know this has been going on for a while, so we'll kind of do it short, but could you kind of tell me a little bit of your thoughts on smart growth zoning and how you think Brockton can really reap the benefits? Um, to talk about smart growth zoning, um, I, I think that that's one of the things that when I was with Somerville, we looked at very closely. Um, the, the ordinance or the, the state law allows you to develop an overlay district, which Brockton has done. Um, one thing that we chose that was different in Somerville was to, because an overlay district always has the base district underneath it. And it overlay district gives me the option of choosing to do the smart growth or I can do what's under the base district. Um, what we chose to do was to really lay out a vision through our zoning and to make it very prescriptive. These are the things that we are looking for. And so if you were going to go into that area, that is the base zone. And so those are the sorts of things that we would expect you to do rather than being an option for you to do. And I think that um, while it was a, a, a great step forward um, for Brockton, I think that there's an opportunity to really look at 
um, creating prescriptive zoning throughout the city so that um, you're really telling developers and property owners this is what we want as opposed to this is what we don't want because if you have that vision if you say these are the things that we need to then they come to the table um, better prepared to deal with and and achieve the goal that we have as opposed to this you know negotiation of well if you do this i'll do that and da 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 and that that takes a lot of time effort and energy and it could waste a lot of money both for the city and for the developer but when you've taken this you know smart growth type plan creating that as a base district it, it really streamlines the the process it becomes much more business friendly property development friendly and the neighbors know exactly what they're going to get next door to them so do you think it's more of a catalyst for investment if, if you enhance it is that is that what you're trying to I, I do, sir. I, okay. I do think okay. it's a good catalyst. Um, in terms of, I sat on the planning board for a, f a few years, and, and you'd be a non-voting member of the planning board, um, and you hit it on the head with Pam. I mean, she's, she's unbelievable, and she's been doing quite she's a bit been, for yeah. many years by herself. Have you been able to meet with any of the planning board members as of yet, or is it a little premature? Uh, I have not met with any of the planning board members. I have been emailing back and forth to get to know Pam a little bit better and, <coughs> and ask some questions uh, on procedures. Okay. Um, she says she's watching on TV tonight, so <laughs> I'm waving. Um, but I didn't, you know, I, I felt that it's very important that I meet you first um, in, in, in deference to your position before I start meeting other people in the community. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. In terms of the master plan and and we have uh, you know we're very lax in terms of a master plan i know there was some <coughs> community meetings uh when the previous uh, planner was here years ago and the previous mayor and but but when you're talking about the city of brockton uh, in my humble opinion our master plan is lacking with your skill sets wh what do you think you can do to to benefit that moving forward in the next decade or so uh, I think it's very important that we create a master plan. Um, one of the, we talked about what do you do first, and, and um, what do we do first? That was your question, sir. Um, we need to have uh, some trend analysis um, that really sets the foundation. Uh, we all have our experience of what Brockton was to us uh, growing up as kids, being some of you being lifelong residents, some of you being new to the community. Um, we need to, to have a firm foundation of, of where we are now and how did we get to that um, situation. And not just anecdotally, but looking at census data, business trend data. Um, on top of that, you build the comprehensive plan. Um, on top of that, you build zoning reform if needed. Um, on top of that, you then build district plans. And it's not just downtown and Montello and, and Campello but it's, it's Chestnut um, out uh, by 24 and the activity, you know, area that's, that's on, I'm pointing in the wrong direction, it's that way, sorry, on the other side of the VA facility uh, that runs along the side of, of 24. It's looking at what's <laughs> happening at Westgate and where you've had uh, a major property owner that had been there for, for quite some time. Little parcels have been chunked off. Things kind of fall out of the sky and there's been no real plan. And so when you look at opportunities for what might happen at the wall, uh, at the mall, you, they've, they've cut themselves off by putting in a, a large retailer, you know, in, at the end of a corridor that, that may have opportunity have had opportunity for growth and so you really need to have a professional looking at that long term so that you don't cut off your nose to spite your face you know a lot of times we have some very deep lots um, and and you'll see somebody build a, a, a one-story facility on the front of that lot and they've completely cut off access to the back of the lot and well that's kind of their right under our current zoning but it's the you know the planning departments the planning boards role and responsibility to go to those kinds of property owners and say hey you know if you were to do x y or z 
you could have more development opportunity, you, you know, and it's good for you because you're getting more money. It's good for us because we're getting more tax dollars. We're getting more employment opportunities. And, and so it's looking at long range. And I have to create a plan that, um, you know, it's coordinating all the community's thoughts and visions, but that is looking out 30 years, um, and, and in some cases, 50 years. And I will probably not be around you know, 30 years from now, God, I hope we can retire at some point in time. But, um, you know, we may see something that comes around and it's like, oh, this is great, let's do this. And then two years later, we look back and say, well, why did I do that? Um, and and it's, it's having that plan, it's well thought out, refreshing it every five years, working with the community, working with the elected officials, working with the, uh, with the residents. Um, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a yeah, little no, bit. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's refreshing to hear. One, one of the other, I think, tag-alongs would be, and, and a few years ago I had the, the state come in to talk about the CPA, Community Preservation Act. Yes. And the city of Brockton, um, at that time, we, we didn't think it was the right thing to do, but a lot of neighboring communities, Easton, Randolph, Bridgewater, use it. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's an increased dollar amount for the residents, but there's a long-term benefit. What are your thoughts on the CPA as it would relate to Brockton maybe in the future? Do you think it has any merit? Um, there is merit in that uh, we have very limited um, revenue that comes into the city. Um, the federal government and the state government are not opening up their wallets anymore. Um, and we really need to look at uh, self-sufficiency, uh, financial self-sufficiency, if, if we're going to be able to get things done. Um, Community Preservation Act can provide those seed funds for working in historic preservation. Uh, for business district improvements, um, also for um, housing rehabilitation. Um, we used it in Somerville, um, uh, providing grants. Uh, we were just getting this started as I was leaving, but the, the point was to provide grants to low and moderate income uh, property owners who own historic properties to help bring those uh, up to code. You couldn't do that with CDBG dollars. It's only life safety kinds of right. activities. Um, and there's also parks and recreation. And it's important that we spend, if, if we chose to go down that way, that we spend some money on our parks. Um, they are really our, our community gathering points. They're very important. Um, and and um, I don't want to dilute the pie too much, but there, there's, um, it's certainly one of the tools that we should look at when we have a very strong plan as to how we're going to spend that money. Yeah, I concur, because they've expanded the, the availability of funds for many, it used to be very restrictive. Yes. You know, just land acquisition, historic renovation, but you're right, parks uh, are in the loop now. So I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, sir. You really answered all the questions for me and, and my colleagues. Thank you. Mr. President. Thank you. Councilor Rodriguez. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. May, uh, welcome to Brockton. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, I'm one of these individuals that... Uh, that actually do not subscribe to ha having a planner or a director of planning just for the sake of having one. Uh, in a way, it's kind of senseless in the sense. I know we, um, we go back and forth in the city talking about how great things were when we had a planner in the, uh, at City Hall and how things went down the chute once the planner left, but I've been living in the city for 30 something years and I don't remember downtown Brockton being the uh, Times Square and once we lost the planner, Times Square moved to New York. So I don't quite remember that. So I just wanted to make sure I kind of said that. But our city is, um, is a city in, in need of, uh, of a great deal of collaboration. Uh, I think our departments don't play all that well with each other in their sandbox. Uh, what examples of collaborations can you actually give us you know, that basically shows us or tells us exactly you know, how well you collaborate with other departments and other uh, folks in, the, in your past experience that you'd bring into this office? I, I think a very strong example of that is, is with the city of North Chicago where the planning department and the building department were co-located in the same facility. That gave us an opportunity to really sit down together um, in the plan review process um, to, uh, w when people come to the, the, the front counter and start explaining a situation, you may hear something out of the, you know, out of the conversation and, and glam on, glom onto that and come out and be part of that conversation. Um, 
and and you're very um, correct in that we all need to row together in the same direction, and it's it's working with the building and ground uh, the ground staff, um, working with um, uh, the street department, uh, sanitary workers. I mean, it's it, we've got a creative vision, and and these are all the departments that are going to be part of of moving that plan forward, and so. Um, using um, a performance-based management approach um, and, and assigning people responsibilities um, through the community, I, I think that we can you know, really bring those people to the table, um, make them a part of the visioning process, because it's got to be their plan too. Otherwise, you're not going to get the street department or, or DPW to do something if they don't believe in this also. I... Um I envision the uh, the planning office and now it being called the planning and development uh, office in the city to be more of the umbrella organization when it comes to the uh, the two other engines of economic development in the city. Uh, what do you see uh, in your role as the director of economic development and planning uh, the roles of B21 and the BRA? Uh, both of those being independent, quasi-independent organizations, um, they are appointed and approved, I believe, by, uh, appointed by the mayor and approved by council. Um, it's important that we are all on that same page. Um, we each control right now a, a, a different portion of the, of the pie, um, whether it's, you know, planning and zoning, uh, business investment dollars, uh, that that the um, uh, redevelopment authority has CDBG, you know, funding, or um, through B21, who's going out and doing some of the marketing and and um, trying to bring people into the community. But we really need to know what we're marketing, where we're marketing it, why do we want it there, how does that advance our goals? And so it's important for me to sit down with those people, with the directors of those organizations, their boards, their staffs. Um, on, a, on a fairly regular basis um, so that we are all on the same page. And it's going to take some coordination to, to, to really um, uh, cement those relationships because I'm, I'm new uh, to the community. But um, I think I have the skill to be able to, to further those relationships. Um, do you envision uh, your department having a strong grant writing uh, division or segment within that planning office because I, sitting here just just asking the council for funds to um, to support the various entities in the city in, in need of help uh, just isn't going to do it alone but I, I i think a way to go is through some grant writing for all kinds of grants that exist out there do you do you envision doing that uh we're going to have to beg borrow and steal um to to bring you know the resources to this community whether it's uh, the state doesn't have uh, very much money, but the federal government has a little bit more. Some of it's discretionary. There's grants through HUD or grants through EPA, um, Fish and Wildlife. Um, there's opportunities to bring those kinds of monies in. When we look at some of you know, the, the uh, uh, Beaver Creek, um, or, or Beaver Brook, excuse me, pardon me, Trout Brook, um, some of those areas, the natural areas that are around um, Field Park, um, I think we need to get, you know, inventive about where we look for money and what opportunities we, that we pursue. But we need to do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Any other questions, Councilors? Entertain a motion. Motion to recommend favorable. Second. Second. Favorable recommendation back to full City Council. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Favorable recommendation uh, to next Monday night's full City Council. Mr. President, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Have a good thank evening. You thank you. Madam Clerk, number three, please. Reappointment, John Stocko of Brockton as a constable in the city of Brockton for a term of three years. Invited John Stocko. Mr. Stocko, good evening. <laughs> Council, as you recall, uh, Council Staninsky uh, asked that we continue this last month because there was only three signatures. I have an inter-office memo from Attorney uh, Nazarella's office. There are five signatures on this application. I entertain a motion unless Mr. Stocko has any uh, statement he wants to make. No. Motion recommend Move. favorably. Second. Motion made, properly seconded for reappointment. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed, Mr. motion President, carries. 
May I please ask to take number eight out of order to postpone it? Mr. Stockel, thank you very much. Thank Have a good you. evening. Thank I apologize. <laughs> Council, you want to take what? Number eight out of order so we can postpone it to the Second. August uh, Finance Committee meeting. There's really no re need to talk about this this evening. Second. Thank you. Motion made, properly seconded to take number eight out of order. All in favor, take oh, oh, no, 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 one minute. Nope. Wrong one. I apologize. Number nine. Second. Number nine. Second. Thank Motion you. made properly second to take number nine out of order. All in favor of that? All opposed? Taking that number nine out of order. Uh, and we're not going to take a motion to waive the reading. I would like to make a motion to waive the reading. Second. second. Motion made properly second, waive the reading. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, number nine to be continued. I entertain a motion to the next uh, Finance Committee. To the next Finance Committee. Second. So, so moved. Motion made properly second to take number nine and continue to the next uh, FinCom in August. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Number Thank nine you very much. is uh, going to be continued. And while we're at it, Councilor Cruz, could you do number 10, please? Make a motion to uh, move number 10 to the next uh, City Council meeting. Second. 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 Uh, next finance meeting, excuse me. In the month of August. Councilors, again, Aquaria was uh, notified us to were broad. That's what number 10 is about. Uh, motion made probably second to continue number 10 until the FinCom, only one FinCom we have because summer session. Uh, so the third Monday in August. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Number nine and number 10 to continue to next month. Madam Clerk, go back to number four, please. Order appropriation of $89,969.70 from the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance Fiscal Year 13 grant to the Brockton Police Fiscal Year 13 Justice Assistance Grant Fund. These grant funds will be used to continue the community's proactive approach in assisting victims of domestic and community violence by hiring a part-time social worker to be housed at the Brockton Police Department. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Johnny Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Robert Hayden, Interim Police Chief, and or his designate. Colonel Crowley, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, sir. Do you have a statement about this at all? Uh, just what's on the agenda here is the grant funds will be used to continue the community's proactive approach in assisting victims of domestic violence and community violence by hiring a part-time social worker to be housed at the Brockton Police Department. Move for a favorable vote. Oh, Second. Actually, I have a question. On the motion. On the motion, Council Barnes first, followed by Council Dubois. Yes, um, uh, Lieutenant Crowley? Yes. Okay, Lieutenant. The social worker, has that person already been hired? I do not believe so. Okay, and will they be an independent social worker or somebody maybe pulled in from DCF or? I'm not sure what the plans are for that. It's, they're gonna managing the domestic violence part, so they're going to have experience in that. Okay. Um, and the funds, are they um, unrestricted, or will they also find their way to be allocated to, like, just day-to-day -day police work or operations, or are they restricted to this particular program? The breakdown is going to be 15000 used to contract department clinicians in support of Operation Divinity ride-alongs, child witness to violence ride-alongs. Wait, wait, wait. Can you, can you just say that really slowly? 15000 to what? used to contract department clinicians that support Operation Divinity ride-alongs, child witness to violence ride-alongs, jail diversion for the mentally ill mm -hmm. ride-alongs and case conferencing. 15,000 will be used for research and evaluation services. 10,000 will be used to purchase computer surveillance and other police equipment. 5,000 will be used for travel and training. And the balance will probably go towards the um, the position that is pending. The, the um, salary? Yes. Okay, so the computer surveillance, how does that play into a social worker riding along? That is just the use plan for these funds by the grant writer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Any further questions, Council Bonds? Oh, no, thank you. Okay, no, Council sorry. Dubois. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, is, was this grant uh, written in uh, preparation for Brockton and the rest of Plymouth County losing their civilian um, advocates at the police department? The district attorney didn't apply for a grant um, to continue uh, Plymouth County having civilian advocates through our <coughs> domestic violence shelters and all the police departments across Plymouth County. So come January 1st, none of the police departments in Plymouth County will have um, DV civilian advocates. Was this grant written in response to that? I don't know for sure, but I would speculate that that would be the reason. Yeah. Um, who wrote this? Michelle Streetmeyer. Well, she's really great. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, thank Mr. You, President. Council Cruz. Thank you. Uh, this might be for Jay. Uh, is there any match from the city? Uh, 
No match, Grant. No match. No match. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilors, we had a motion in favor of recommendation number four back to the full city council. It was properly second. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Favorable recommendation. Thank you, Lieutenant. Have a good night. Madam Clerk. Order appropriation of 130000 from the Stabilization Fund to the MSBA Accelerated Repair Program for the Ashfield Middle School, Barrett Russell School, Brookfield School, and the Gilmore School Early Childhood Center in order to provide funding to collaborate with the MSBA and conduct a feasibility study for the potential roof, boiler, window, and door replacements at the named schools. However, for the record, the stabilization fund balance prior to a favorable vote is only $2.4 million. Additional future funding from city sources will be imposed a significant financing challenge, even with the state assistance of 80 percent. The certification letter is not acceptable to these future costs, which will likely be from borrowing with city council approval to be sought at a later date. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Kathleen Smith, Superintendent, and or her designee. Sister Assistant Superintendent, Mr. Thomas, thank you for being here tonight. You're welcome. Hitting. Thanks, Mike. Councilors, uh, first of all, Mike, do you, uh, Mr. Thomas, do you have a uh, statement or anything? Sure. Um, uh, this um, program is called the Accelerated Repair Program from the MSBA. Um, about five years ago, they used to call it the Green Repair Program, where uh, actually we were awarded the most schools back then um, with your support. Uh, it was a $36 million project back in 2010 um, for eight schools. Two of these schools, actually three of these schools, the Raymond and Davis, for those of you that remembered that uh, the Raymond school was about to be closed due to the severe condition of the roof uh, and the Davis was not far behind. The auditorium at North Junior High was closed and condemned because the roof fell through at that in 2009. And this accelerated repair program, which was back then the green repair program, uh, basically saved those three schools. Um, now they call it the accelerated repair program, and it's a program that replaces big ticket items in schools, roofs, boilers, and windows. Uh, it comes out every year. This year I put in um, applications for four schools and for a total of six projects, and those were uh, welcomed into the program from, by the MSBA. So what they're looking for now is the, the city to pay for the feasibility study, uh, 130,000, Aldo, 100, roughly 130,000, which the state provides you with an architect and a contractor. They come in and they look at these six projects at these four schools and basically give you the price tag. And once they come up with that price tag, they would have to come back to the city council and then you get to choose either uh, accepting uh, the 20% share in moving the program forward. You could accept all six projects. You, you might only accept two. It's at the discretion of the city council. So again, we are because of the um, free and reduced lunch um, percentage in Brockton, we do get the highest percent of uh, reimbursement from the MSBA, which is 80%. So I'll entertain thank any, you, any questions. Thank you. Uh, Councilor DiNapoli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thomas, good evening. Good evening. So this is an 80% reimbursement program. Correct. If, if, if we get accepted into it. Correct. So we, we originally put up the 130000 to uh, sort of buy into the program, and they come down and they look at all these things. Um, I have a question for Mr. Conant, because we did this in 2010, and are we paying, a, are we paying on that, Jay, right now? Uh, we're selling the bonds, which ended up being just about $7 million. We're selling the bonds in a couple of weeks, and when we sell the bonds, we'll be paying at that point, and that's for our share in that project. Okay, so this will be on top of yes. that? Yes. Okay, so, you know, in dollars and cents, what is the monthly note? Or does it, do, do we the, pay monthly or yearly? On the bonds, that, we, year, on the bonds that we're about to sell, uh, it'll be several hundred thousand dollars a year as, as we pay those off. On this program, it would depend upon the extent of the program that you decided to accept. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Jay. Mr. Thomas, on this, I, I know that you were involved in, in, in the last project. How many millions are we looking at? Um, what, do you, what do you think the I, deal? I took with the roofs cost, uh, basically the, they did the Hancock School last time. It cost about uh, $2.2 million to do the Hancock School. One of the schools this time is the Brookfield, which is basically the sister school of the, of the Hancock built in 1965. Um, I added a percentage to that, figuring it would be about you know, $2.5 million with, 
with inflation. Uh, I look at this again. This is my rough estimate mm -hmm. of if you if you went and bought into all six projects, it'd be about roughly ten million dollars. But again, million. that's the feasibility study would give us the exact number. But my estimate from my previous experience back in 2010 would be about ten million dollars total. Now, does this program come out every so many years? Or it comes out every year. It comes out every year. Um, and then I I basically wait to apply. Um, obviously, I haven't applied for four years because obviously because you know budgets being tight and um, and waiting to see how the facilities hold up and, and I only put in for projects that I know that things will have to be done within the next two to three years and, and obviously this is a way to get 80% funding no well, anytime you can get any reimbursement from the state you, you say thank you very much yeah. well mr. Thomas you're doing a great job and thank you and thank you mr. chairman thank, thank you, you Council. Council. Council Rodriguez uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Thomas, good evening. How are you? Thank you. Good. Um, my question was actually asked by uh, Council Denampoli, but uh, Mr. Chairman, if you allow me just a little leeway, I know that uh, the superintendent was supposed to be on the agenda tonight, but she's not going to be here and as soon as Mr. Thompson is. Sure. Is it thundering outside or something? Um, <laughs> I like, and then I'll like make a motion to see if we can postpone that until the next uh, uh, FinCom meeting, if possible. But if you allow me a little leeway, I just have a quick question to ask Mr. Thomas of something that's kind of related to your position anyways. Um, and this has nothing, nothing to do with the, with the schools or the sure. repairs. But uh, many communities in Massachusetts um, <coughs> use food to transport their children to school, as we do. But I, um, I've driven throughout the state on and off to do, something, to do some work and stuff like that. And I've noticed that, for instance, the city of Springfield uh, uses the same bus company to transport their students. But on the side of their buses, it does say Springfield Public Schools. What prohibits uh, the city of Brockton for, uh, from doing the same exact thing? Because what, what I see is it just like I saw those Springfield buses in our community. I see our buses traveling throughout the community. We were just here talking about e economic development, promotion, and some of the good stuff that actually some of these communities do. But we don't do a great deal of job in this city promoting our city. So I actually see that as almost as a banner that drives around. I mean, we do. They use those buses around the communities uh, in the you know in the parochial schools and things like that. What prohibits the school the school buses from having the Brockton Public School uh, on the side of those buses as they are in some of these other communities that, and on the bottom of the buses it says owned and operated by a student, for a student. So it's not like, you know, Springfield is owning the buses or operating the buses. It's still operated by for a student. So why couldn't we do the same thing for Brockton? Well, we couldn't. That's, um, I have to be honest, I've never asked that question of first student, but I'll be happy to ask that on your behalf. I. We have a good relationship with the general manager who basically oversees the uh, whole Northeast, and I'll, I can be on the phone with him tomorrow asking that's a good point, and uh, I have no problem I would that seriously question. appreciate that, and yep. thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing that little free. No, no problem. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. That was a good question, Councilor. Uh, that's followed by Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Thomas. Um, I know part of the report we're going to get later tonight is about how crowded we are right now and how many students the projects you're looking at here are any of these buildings bad enough that if the if we're not able to get anything done uh, are any of these buildings reaching where you couldn't use them um they're not at that level but the the roofs um there's a window project here and there's um, a boiler project at the ashfield uh i would say the three roofs and the um and the boilers at the ashfield would be the the top priorities top because, priorities um, but they are starting to leak and show wear, and it's been uh, over 30 years that those roofs are, uh, are over 30 years old. So, um, and again, to be to be clear, there, there's none of them are at the level that the Davis You'd and the Raymond them, are at. That down. we would have to close them. No, but uh, they're getting there. Okay, and 130,000 is not. We don't get any reimbursement for that. We just um, ended up. You would get 80% reimbursement on that if we went forward with the that program. That would be rolled into the... Uh, into, the into the whole... Into the whole the thing, program. if we were able to do that. Exactly. What's, what do you see for a time frame of coming back and looking for the added money if we were going to do that? Uh, probably not until, I would say, late November. 
Um, they would come out um, probably throughout the fall to evaluate the projects and the roofs. It, it takes a while. They do some cut testing and they have to take things back to the lab. So I would think that we wouldn't be back until probably right before Thanksgiving. For, for approval uh, with, with and a, then well, basically with a price tag. With and a price tag and exactly. look for approvals and then construction next summer. It would be the summer of, two, of 15, correct. Of 15. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. You're thank welcome. you, Mr. Hey, Chairman. Council, any other questions? Council Bonds. Uh, yes, I just have one really quickly. Um, is there any chance that we could get denied or, or not get into this program, or is it kind of a guarantee? No, we're guaranteed. We're in. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're in. All right. If, if, I mean, if you, if you appropriate the funding we're in, but the MSBA has welcomed us into this, this program. Oh, okay. So they said just come up with the funds and we'll do yes, the study exactly. and care. Okay. Got it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Dubois. Hi. How are Hi. you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm really excited about these projects. I think you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, just to, so if you're saying it's around 10, 10 million, does that mean the city would be on the hook for two million? Correct. And the state would pay for eight million. Correct. That's just a great investment in our kids. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Move thank to approve. Second. Second. Thank you, Council Yaneri. Motion made properly. <laughs> second. Favorable recommendation back to full city council. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed. Motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to full city council. Madam Clerk, come Mr. Six, Mr. Please. Chairman. Councilor. Uh, I, I would actually ask the uh, the council to. Um, Postpone the resolve if I could take the uh, number 11 out of order and postpone that until our next FinCon meeting. Second. Wait, wave the reading as well, Council. Correct, sir. Motion made. Properly seconded. Take number 11 uh, out of order. Wave the reading. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed. Motion carries. Motion was made to continue to the next FinCon in August. Was it second? Yes, Fair second. Motion made. Properly seconded to take uh, number 11 and continue it to the next FinCon, which is the third Monday in August. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. It's continued. Council, can I just. On behalf of the superintendent, I spoke to her on the way here. She wanted me to apologize uh, on her behalf. She's ill and not able to make it tonight, but she wanted me to send along her regrets, and she looks forward to meeting with you uh, on the date you select. Thank you. And please tell her and Mr. Minicello that was a very well-crafted letter that was generated, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Have a good evening. Number six, Madam Clerk. Order that the City Council authorize the approval of the net metering power purchase agreement between Nugen Capital Management, LLC, and the City of Brockton. This agreement is for the purchase of solar power from a solar plant, which will save the city in electricity costs. Invited John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazrella, City Solicitor, David Milner, Chief Executive Officer of Nugent Capital Management. Mr. Conan, good evening. Uh, good evening, Councilors. Uh, this uh, particular order should be somewhat familiar to you. It's, it's a new project, but it's uh, kind of a pro uh, program that you've approved in the past. Basically, the city contracts for the private developer to buy all of the solar output from a particular solar project outside the city. In exchange for that, we buy all that output. In exchange for that, we get the credit of those uh, applied to our electric bills. And the cost of what we're buying is only about 80% of the cost of what we're saving. So the annual savings to the city in electric bills is about 130000 a year on this project. And I'd hope you'd approve it, save us some money. Thank you, Mr. Conn. And uh, Council Cruz, followed by Council Bonds. Thank you. Um, I know we've done a few others of these, Jay, and they have been, you know, money savers for us. Is there a limit to? Yes. And are we near that limit? Or? Um, well, we were ap approaching it, but we've, uh, uh, it's, it's structured on the basis of your electric billing from the electric utility. And uh, we have a separate billing from the power source, which is Constellation New Energy, for, as from uh, the transmission and distribution company, which is National Grid. But we've combined those so that now that we're getting billed for the power purchase by Constellation through National Grid, we've essentially doubled our capacity. So this is the first bite out of that new apple, and we would we'll take a piece of it, but we can do some more as a result of that. So we, you may be able to come back for the For a couple more. more. Yeah, we've, pro we've probably got about uh, 300 and some odd thousand dollars, maybe $400,000 worth of savings that are in the projects that have been done, including this one, and we've got a couple hundred thousand dollars more we can come up with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council Bonds is withdrawn. Any other questions? Motion, a motion to approve. Second. second. Motion made properly. Second. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Madam Clerk, number seven, please. Oh, 
order that the City Council authorizes the Mayor to enter into the intermunicipal agreement between the Town of Abington and the City of Brockton for transport and treatment of wastewater from Abington and transmission. This agreement is intended to supersede and replace the current agreement between the parties. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nesrella, City Solicitor, Larry Rowley, Acting Commissioner, DPW, John Stone, Abington Superintendent of Utilities. Israel. Good evening. Good evening, Council President. Good evening, members of the Council. Uh, before you this evening is the uh, adoption of an intermunicipal agreement with the Town of Abington. Uh, we have had a very uh, long and, and oftentimes arduous struggle to get to this point. Uh, we have uh, met on a regular basis, at least a monthly basis, with the Town of I, uh, Abington as a result of a uh, previous suit which challenged the methods of calculations. Oh. Uh, by Brockton, uh, monitoring in view of a billing policy, inspection of meters, uh, and we have uh, come to a definitive and comprehensive agreement which speaks to all of those issues as well as increases the uh, flow from the town of Abington to a million and a half gallons per day. Uh, this evening, uh, we are joined by attorney Christopher Petrini, who represents the town of Abington, together with two of the uh, selectmen, uh, as well as uh, Jay Condon, who was part and parcel of all of those um, uh, discussions in meetings with the town of Abington. So we have made a, a, great, a great deal of resolution and success in forming this comprehensive agreement, which we uh, present before the city. Thank you, attorney. Mr. Chairman. Council Dubois. Hi, Mr. Nazarella. What was the contract for before? Excuse me? What was the contract for right now? What is it for? Well, right the salient part of the previous contract was that it limited to a million gallons per day. But there were some uh, intricacies and uh, gaps regarding the calculation methods, and that became a, a, an issue of debate between the two municipalities. I'm sure the residents, a lot of them will be on Abington's side that have had the similar problems with Brockton's calculation of water and sewer rates. Well, I can't speak to that. I was more or less concentrating on the Brockton side. Sure, of course. All right. Um, is this going to, what, what, what kind of uh, fallout is it going to have to us disposing of the waste? After it goes through the whole process, is there going to be more, um, more burning of this waste or what's going to happen? So we're going to have more particulate matter coming out of the incinerator? What's happening No, this, this will be approved. Uh, we, we went through the NIPSTES process. Uh, we went through the regulatory process. We don't expect this to have a significant effect over the flow that's, that's currently introduced into the system now. Could you explain what the um, NIPSTES process is and the regulatory that, That's just a, a regulatory where we have to appear before the state Anytime we make a, a substantial increase in this, um, in this type of a process. In fact, um, Attorney Petrini, I believe, has been through that process before and may, may want to speak to that. What department did you go before? Did you already go through this process? No. Okay. No. So you're, we're approving a contract, and then if it's approved, you'll go through the process? That's correct. Wonderful. I'd love to hear from, from you, Attorney, if you don't mind. Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President, and City Council, and Ms. Nizrella. Um, yeah, this, this process has gone on for about uh, 14 months, where the meeting meetings about every month. And what's important about this agreement is, as Mr. Nizrella noted, where Abington is presently allowed to flow 1 million gallons per day, and we have the right under this agreement to flow up to 1.5 million gallons per day, but only upon NIPTI's approval and only upon payment of the, the appropriate rates that are set forth in the agreement. So I think both sides would agree it's, it is a fair agreement for both sides because uh, Brockton will receive further revenue uh, for its system that will help uh, uh, subsidize its operations and Abington will have the opportunity uh, to develop further areas. But it's all subject to state approval. Um, and in reference to that, under Section 3 of the IMA, as to your question about the impact, uh, you look there that it basically requires that Abington follow all the rules and regulations of Brockton in terms of making sure that sulfides and sulfates are limited and that basically that the material being distributed into Brockton to the wastewater treatment plant meets all the standards of Brockton. So there won't be any issues with Abington flow causing further problems to the Brockton system. So, well, thank you. Well, 0.5 million gallons will be... Um, 
the byproduct of that, will, will it be incinerated? So that's an additional amount of incineration going into Brockton sewer incinerator, correct? I, but I believe some of it will be incinerated and some of it will be flown into the, uh, into the, into the river, but it will all be pursuant to NIPTI's approval. So that, that's under review right now, and there's a, a very extensive regulatory process. We don't have that oh, approval. Could you give me a, like an overview of what the NIPTI's process is? I can. What, what that involves is it's, it's a joint process between the Massachusetts uh, DEP and the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, that evaluate the, the permit that has been granted to Brockton, and that, pro that permit has actually been expired for several years, and that's not unusual. I do a lot of this work around the state, and that's very common that these permits do expire. There's nothing wrong with it. It just shows the, the level of backlog that the, um, that the state has in dealing with this. But what happens is basically the environmental scientists and engineers, they look at the the upgrades and the capacity to the Brockton plant, and uh, folks in Brockton are well aware that over $100 million has been spent in Brockton to upgrade uh, the system here in Brockton, and I think that will go a long way to get it, obtaining the approval from the state, but they'll, they'll conduct environmental assessments of, of the manner in which the sewage is, is treated, transported, and disposed of, and only when they are satisfied on an environmental basis that there's going to be no harm to the, to the Taunton River and the discharge will they approve it. So it's a, it's a rather lengthy regulatory process that goes on for, it could take up to a, six months to a year. So. Is the amount of incineration calculated in this permit at all, or is it all about discharge into the river? I'm pretty sure that the incineration is calculated. Um, and the, the, way that the, the way that the old permit read was that it talked about certain uh, particulates or certain sewage uh, components, um, organic material. That's how it was measured. The new NIPTES permit, my understanding is, is that they're putting a maximum uh, number of millions of gallons per day into the permit, and uh, that, that gallonage will have to still meet environmental requirements. Uh, but it's been a lengthy process between Brockton and Abington, but I, I, I think Brockton is confident that there's enough capacity to address this, you know, in, on the Brockton side to handle this and receive the extra revenue. And the agreement does provide that if, if uh, NIPTI's approval is not given for the increased capacity, then we just stay at the one million gallon level. What's the, um, what's the current capacity for the city's um, wastewater treatment plant and, or, and the incinerator? Good evening, Mr. Raleigh. Good evening. Um, right now with the old NIPTIs, it's, it's 18 million. 18 million? Yes. And that's with the, um, that's taking it into the plant. We can take it 18 million ga gallons. We can gallons. flow 18 million into the river. 18 million into the river? Uh, discharge, yes. Okay. Uh, so F1, we take in F1 much flow. more than that, right? Excuse me? We take in much more no, than that. No, we don't. So. No, we take a lot less, Councillor. Right now we're averaging between 12 and 14 million a day. Okay, I guess what I, I may have, I think I just put my, my questions differently. So say we take in 12 million gallons a day. Um, we don't release 12 million gallons into the water, I mean into the river, because don't we take out um, human waste from that? Well, some of, the, some of the, we call that the gray water. Yeah, you're absolutely right. If we take in 12, there might be 500 to 600,000 gallons that go through the plant that we use for process with, with the different... Um, process cycles it goes through. And then you come out with this, um, like a solid substance. I'm not going to go into detail of what it is. And then... Thank you, Councilor. You're welcome. We incinerate <laughs> it, right? Yes, we burn the sludge. Yes. How much of the sludge, what's like, how much do we burn a day? Around, or whatever rate you would, you would use, like what's your, it's, whatever it's, measure you would naturally use. I, I don't know that question, but I can get that to you, but it's not a, it's not a lot. So is our... It's so, not a lot. I'd like to know how much we do burn a day, and then the incinerator has to be permitted for a certain amount, right? Yes. What, do you know yes. what it's permitted for? I don't. We're going through what we're calling a MAC testing now of the incinerator. What is that called? It's, a, it's MAC testing, and we're going through that now with our engineering, and once we get all that data back, I can forward it to you with That's no problem. That's wonderful. Now, what That's kind no of, problem. What kind of data is that going to project out? It's gonna, anything that it's, the, the particulates, anything that's in the air. Okay, so it's a big air monitoring yes, it process is. you're yes. doing. Yes, and we have to go through that anyway with um, DEP and EPA, so. How often do we do That's why we're that? doing that. that it, it's renewal time. I want to say it's probably every five years. 
Is that based on actual testing of the stack, or is that based on scientific calculation, based on the um, the uh, tonnage or the? Oh, it's the, the actual testing of the air. The actual testing of the air, not yes. based on scientific calculation on the gallons or anything like that. No, I'm I'm sure that's all involved with it too. Sure. I would really, I, I think I'd like to invite you guys in to talk about that a little bit. So I'll, I'll file that. That seems really interesting. And do you think the, do you, is the goal of this to be able to expand that incinerator's capacity so we can take in more uh, Well, well, well right now it's, it's regulated that we can do that 18 million gallons a day. With and that, we only take with, in 12 now anyway. We're taking 12 or 14. Some days it's a little less. Rain, rain events, it's a little bit more. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. You're President. Welcome. First of all, thank you, Attorney Petrini. Thank you. Um, Council Barnes, did you have a question? I did, yes. Um, is um, Mr. Stone here? Oh, hi. If you could. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. You're the one I spoke to, right? That's correct. Excellent. Okay, I just kind of wanted to, just for the folks at home, because um, they might, they may have had the same questions that I had, some okay. base questions that I, I figured may not be um, presented here that they might be interested in. Excuse my voice. I lost my voice this weekend. I'm sorry. Um, but the current, <laughs> the current contract that we have right now, it's good until when? Either 2018 or 2023, depending on what law you read. Um, we're not positive on that right now. Okay, and um, currently the, the contract is, is like a 35-year contract, but they're brush pushing them back to 20? Amendment number three was signed in 1998, and it's good until 2035, and that's against the law, supposedly. Okay, and then this contract now, if we enter in this contract with the town of Abington, we will not, not be in violation of breaking the first contract, no. correct? No. Okay, and um, the, the fee, the way the fee is calculated that we'll get, um, because it was mentioned earlier about the increased fee to Brockton, um, how is that determined? What's the formula for that? Um, it's a more basic formula now. Before, with the amendment number three that was signed back in 1998, it was a convoluted formula that was very difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. Now it's just based on our gallons divided by the city's gallons and just to come up with one percentage to use in the calculations. Okay, and you guesstimated about how much percentage would uh, Abington yield to Brockton? Uh, to the FY 2013, I think we were at 6.3% of Brockton's total wastewater. Total use. Right. Total use. Okay. And um, this contract, it is exclusive to Abington, correct? So that there will be no other kind of buy-ins or anything like no. that? Okay. And, and um, it takes effect when? Uh, upon execution, uh, signing by both parties. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay, great. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Thank you. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nazarello, I guess, so we got this packet and I was trying to look through it, but basically in a simple way. So what, we had this contract in place, but Abington sued us to break this contract? I mean, walk me through a timeline of why we're, we're well, doing this. No, Abington sued us because there was some disparity in the billing system. And uh, there was a large chunk of money that wasn't being paid based upon the, uh, the allegation that they were being overcharged. And also, there were issues regarding the metering and the flow. We addressed all of those. Uh, in, we also had uh, a difference of opinion relating to Council Bond's question about when the contract ends. Brockton had an opinion, Abington had an opinion. We formed a comprehensive agreement to address all of those issues regarding metering, flow, um, oversight, as well as a superseding contract, which was which would take us for 20 years. And under the new so it did, but the, the simple answer to your question: this all did arise from the lawsuit from Abington. But and so, and I'm a little confused. Then, are we metering? Or are we looking at the cost of running the system and giving them a? We're going. That'll be both. So they get metered, and then we decide how much the plant costs to run. That's correct. And does that include everything? Does that include insurances and uh, any fines that we might have to pay? Um, well, no, it wouldn't include, you know. Um, I mean, how do you arrive at the cost, uh, the audited Brockton sewer budget? How do we arrive at that? Maybe Jay can answer okay. that. It might be easier if I tried that. Yeah. Yep. 
basically the contract treats Abington as a common user of the system. So if the Brock and Sewer budget is $15 million a year, it's a little bit more, but say it was 15 and they're in at, uh, at a million and a half uh, of the capacity, would be roughly 10%, then they'd be 10% of the $15 million. That's, that's basically how it would work. So the meter is metered flow of Abington as it comes into the plant. And then the budget is applied to that metered flow as a percentage of the total flow at the plant. There are a few exclusions from uh, that budget cost because Abington, even though it's treated as a common user, isn't really a common user of certain services. For example, they don't use our meter system. Uh, they don't need to pay for the collector's office and trying to recover unpaid tax bills. But for the most part, most of the cost that's in the sewer budget as audited can be presented to Abington and then on the basis that they represent of the total flow, they pay that percent. And they tr they're treated as a common user, not just of the plant, but of the collection system because they come across our collection so system. So if there's piping issues, yes. that's part of the, the yes. audited budget? It's all in there, yes. Um, workman's comp? Yes, Somebody cost, of the, cost, of, cost of the uh, workman's comp would be part of the collection system cost because you've got those workers maintaining the collection system. Yep. The excluded items are pretty minor. Like I said, it's the meter budget. Uh, you know, we borrow money to pay for those meters, uh, postage for mailing out our bills to our customers, those kinds of costs that really aren't part of Abington's cost. If there's a late payment, we get to charge interest as a dispute rec uh, reconciliation process. The old uh, agreement also attempted to treat Abington as a common user, but it took the budget and pulled it <coughs> apart because uh, when they went to a million gallons from a half million, that's when that amendment was executed. We left in place, at the time, they were only paying for the uh, treatment plant cost. They weren't paying for the collection system cost. So they were allowed to go up to a million ga gallons, but we tried to find a way of taking out the treatment plant cost and then backing into what the rest of the costs were, and that's what caused the confusion. But this system, it's pretty straightforward. I think it's a good model for uh, future agreements as well. And who else, this might be something for Larry, probably, who else is on the system? What are the mun municipalities? Well, they're, they're all a little bit different. Uh, Abington is in uh, and Whitman is in, but Whitman uh, sewage comes directly into the plant, whereas Abington comes in to the Brockton system and then comes across the Brockton system to get to the plant. So Whitman's contract doesn't provide for full sharing of the collection system cost. Stonehill comes in and is treated on a um, uh, block rate basis. Now there's a dispute as to what's the appropriate block rate, but we're not doing any ca cost calculations there. We're just saying here's your meters, here's your flow, here's the rate we're charging you. Um, I think um, the other uses of the system are also in, uh, they're not municipalities, they're private entities uh, such as the Gables. They're in on a uh, metered basis and a block rate charge. Okay. And if they go, go over the uh the allowed amount is it just a penalty a fiscal penalty or uh, do we well there's a there is a penalty provision in there that if on a not on a single day but we calculate this rolling average and if there's a rolling average excess then there's a penalty each month that that happens and I guess this might be for Larry right now the the sewer commissioner makes a decision about a new sewer connection any new sewer connection who oversees that as part of the if Abington wants to add in other words, right now, and congratulations, I'm glad you're the acting superintendent of the DPW. Thank you. Um, who, um, so right now, you know, and we vote in Ward 6 for Ward 6, but we only vote to give the superintendent the permission to do it. Who, if Abington wants to add, you know, somebody wants to build apartments and there's 500 new units, do we get, do you get to approve those sewer connections or? Council, I believe we, where they have, where we increase their daily use, to a million and a half, they have to stay within that million and a half. That would be up to Well, Abington. I guess that's one of my question. So if it goes over, what happens? Well, then, like Jay just said, that there is a penalty clause in there if they go over the running average. I can't remember what the fee was, but what was it, Jay? I think it's 10000 a month. I think it's in yeah. here somewhere. But yeah, so I'm we, we, I guess we, we always monitor their flows, and, and they send us a flow report every month anyway, and we keep the running average. So we know exactly how much flow is coming into the city. But if down the road they added a, a, a large users, a large volume of users, um, do we have a way to stop the sewage? Uh, how does that yeah, work? Yeah, through, through fines. But only through fines? Only through fines. I believe we'd have an action under the law because the contract limits them to a million and a half gallons a day. If they get 
perpetually, successively, for a long period of time over that, substantially, we'd have an action under the law, I would think, contract. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Constance, President. any other questions? Constance? Yes. Consul. Mr. 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 Rowley, may I ask you a question, Mr. Rowley? Thank you. Um, how many gallons per day could you or any one of your folks uh, that are on your team estimate like 200 two-bedroom condos are going to use? I've been approached by someone that literally wants to build 200 condos off of North Quincy Street, which would cause some significant infrastructure problems up in the Brookfield area. Are we opening up a Pandora's box with this, or, or what's going on here? I, I don't believe so, because this was an agreement that we had to get done with Abington, but as far as Brockton, we can regulate how much flow that comes that goes to that plant but right now aren't they at their capacity the 1 million they're at capacity so if we wanted to allow someone from Abington to hook into our sewer system it has to come before the council for a vote as it stands now because we did it recently with the um with garage up on uh, North Quincy Street is recently no, yeah like in the last six months a, a, a car garage their septic failed and they just needed a bathroom for the two employees that work there so I brought that before the City Council they did some engineering studies that you guys approved and then we approved that sewer hookup now these 200 condos um, and I know from um, my my predecessor Donna Daly when uh, the uh, the condos that are over 55 went in right now the gabe no i forget the name of them the ones off of north quincy street um there are condos up there now those were a constant problem for her um because the capacity was there and she was at abington meetings like on a weekly basis she said that she had a lot of problems with the negotiations because um, it's really nothing off of Abington's back to allow, no offense, to allow 300 condos to go in because it's all coming in off of North Quincy Street, which really isn't in their town. So how much, how much um, sewer would 300 condos or 200 condos potentially use in a day? Would that be 500 gallons? I, no. Or would it be how much capacity? I how many bedrooms are you talking? Say we three. usually go by bedrooms. Let's go by bedrooms. It's hard to figure out right give now. Give me an Council. estimate. I, so I, I don't want to give you a wrong number. I, I, I could probably. Well, I don't want to vote for a contract that's more or less going to damn the city to have uh, 200 more condos right off of North Quincy Street with no help with the, the multiple deaths that are happening up there because of the traffic that's already insane on North Quincy Council, Street. Councilor, that's not what's before us right now. I think the, the septic. Traffic, the traffic is no, what's it, before us. No, you're correct. Us. But I the, am correct, but You are, but the septic is, so I, I'll stay on I think point. The, I think the answer from, uh, from the CFO, and I think it was concurred by Acting Commissioner and the attorney, is this, this, the contract is the contract, and we have a finding process if they exceed sure. that, and we can sue them for breach if yes. they exceed that. So we have two bites of the apple. I'm just asking a different question, if you wouldn't mind. I'll stay on point. So, Councilor, I, I, I think we can handle the flow, if that's what you're asking me, so, with the increase to Abington also. So when you go by bedrooms, uh, what would what would that be like what just you don't even have to do the calculation for me just tell me what what the equation is do you hear that council so 220. One, 110 for a one bedroom 220 for for a two bedroom so when you say two two what do you mean by 110? Gallons. I'm sorry. Okay. 110 gallons. So it would so be you can 220 gallons for a two-bedroom? Yes. Per day? Yes. And they're asking for $5 million? What are they asking for extra? Who? 500,000. 500,000. 500, and you're saying 500,000 gallons? That's, that's what Abington's asking for. That's the increase. 500,000 gallons, and you said it's um, 220 gallons a day. For a two bedroom. For a two bedroom. Two bedroom, condo, house. That's a lot of water. What is it? 200 gallons a day. So 200 gallons a day. So that's um, like 2,000 additional um, two bedroom home sewer hookups. No. For the city of Brockton. For the, for the 500,000 uh, 
for the 500,000 extra gallons. <coughs> okay, could I ask one of the selectmen a question, please? So we take, okay, we take 500,000 and we divide that by 220. And that is 2,272 per day. But we have to do 365 days. Hold on, so five, 220 times 365 equals I'm gonna take a minute recess. Councilors, we're back in the session. We're gonna go right back to Council Dubois. Thank Council you. Could I, could I speak with one of the selectmen, please? We do really have uh, a fellow elected official from Abington, Mr. Burbine, joins us tonight. Thank you for being here tonight, sir. Thank you. Hello, Thank you. selectmen. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, so what, what, is, what is the town's plan to, what are you gonna use this extra capacity for? What is your thought process? That would obviously be up to whoever, whatever developers or whatever other people want to build in town. There's not a lot of room for development in Abington, I can tell you that. There's not a lot of open space to be built upon. There are some subdivisions, but not, uh, I don't think we'll come close to this 500,000 gallon limit based upon what the uh, superintendent or the super department says. And at any time in probably the next 30 or 40 years, we'll never come close to it. Okay. Do you think I could ask the superintendent a question, please? That's up to you, the president. I really appreciated <laughs> that. Thank you. Mr. Stone, thank you, Selectman Burbine, hey, for being here tonight. Mr. Hello, Stone. Hello, Superintendent. I appreciate you being here this Anytime. evening. How many homes do you think 500,000 uh, gallons are going are gonna to manage? How many? How many homes? Yeah, how many, how many hookups when you think about it? What do you think it's going to take to push you to that 500,000? That's about 2,000 homes, but. 2,000 homes, which yeah. that means that, yeah. So 2,000 homes. Right. But I, I don't think we'll ever approach. 2,000 homes in town. So we could be approaching the 200 off of North Quincy Street, though. That could all come in. I haven't heard in. anything about that. Yeah. I know nothing about it, to be honest with you. Okay. We'll be ready for it. Yes, I'm I will. I'm telling you right now. I will. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Council. Any other questions? I did take a motion, Council. Uh, actually, I Council I have, Bonds, you have one? I have the last up? one. Yes. Um, I believe this one might be for the mayor. Mayor Carpenter, good evening. Good evening, Mr. President. Good evening, Councilors. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Um, does this have well, any... I had a question for me. I hated to think I was going to sit there all night and not get one question. So. Oh, no. I got one for you. Um, does this have anything to do with the uh, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System? What? <laughs> that's what we're talking about. That's what we've been talking oh, about Oh, okay. Long. All right. That's what that's, right. that yeah. acronym... That's what the whole earlier conversation was all about that in terms of the approval. Oh, okay, so this is, okay, so this has to do with um, the request of the EPA. There's a request of the EPA to be able to increase the, the volume? For just the increase, I think it requires both DEP and EPA. Okay, and then it goes, um, and it's still and it's my understanding and I'm not an attorney I didn't negotiate the contract but my understanding of the contract is that um, th it's subject to obtaining the approval okay so the this uh, the in, this increase has to go through first before this contract can be um, no the, the contract right, can confused. be entered into but the additional consumption we won't accept the additional until and unless it's It'll remain the one million. Right. Okay, Subject I understand. Subject to, Council. Subject to, that's, thank you, Mr. President. Subject okay. to. Okay, all right, I understand that. And just to be clear that this is just with regard to the town of Abington. Correct. Okay, so it's not some foundation basis for um, additional growth or economic growth in the city of Brockton. No, this, this agreement that's in front of the council is specifically to the town of Abington. Okay, but uh, further on, will this, have, will this be able to support additional um, uh, growth here in Brockton with, with a company, if, for instance, if a if company needs right. this? Right, so I think I understand your question now. No, our estimates are very conservative in looking at this issue. Our primary concern is always making sure we reserve enough, enough additional capacity for future development here in the city. We're not gonna strangle off development in Brockton to help our neighbors. Uh, okay, I'll, I think- I'll we're, we're, um, we're currently permitted for 18 million gallons a day. We're only using about 14 million gallons a day. Right. Another half a million um, still leaves us a substantial cushion for future development here in the city. 
to 20.5. The eighteen to twenty point five is what's pending right now, but right. today we're already we're already permitted for eighteen million. Okay. And we're only using about fourteen million on it on average. As the commissioner said earlier, it fluctuates. It's not the same number every day. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. I think your question is about are we protecting future development here in Brockton? Yes we are. Not protecting, but just setting um, like I said, setting a foundation to accept a particular right. um, large project. Absolutely. But that's what I'm, that's what I'm Abs concerned absolutely. about. Absolutely, we're on the same page. We're, we're, at all times, we would always be sure that we save capacity for Brockton so that we can foster economic development here in the city by having available sewerage. Yeah, no, that's not what I said. Okay. That's okay. All right. All right, thank you, though. I thought I understood your question. <coughs> thank you. Motion to approve. Mr. Second. Chairman, on the motion. I got one on the motion myself, Councilor. <coughs> uh, Attorney Petrini, who's the signing authority for the town of Abington. Is it the selectman or is it a manager? Or? Thank you, Mr. President. The agreement provides that for Abington, it's the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Sewer Commissioners. And for Brockton, it's proposed that it be the City Council to authorize the mayor to, to sign. I'm Thank you, sir. Say. Thank you. Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to um, be clear for the residents at home that weren't privy to the moment of um, break that we took, the, the, the city told me that the gallons used was per day, 220 gallons per day. And as it turns out, it's 220 gallons a year, which makes much more sense when you times that out to have 2,000 homes. And I just have a significant concern that our own city has given really bad information to even do a basic analysis with, and that's just my comment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor. There's been a motion, right? Motion. Yes. It's been Second. seconded, right? Correct. Yes. Motion made properly seconded. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed, motion carries. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here tonight. We're going to move on. Number eight, Madam Clerk. Order the City Council of the City of Brockton petitions the Great and General Court under the provisions of Section 8 of Article 89 of the Amendments to the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for an act as follows, an act providing for rent regulations and the control of evictions in manufactured housing in mobile home communities in the City of Brockton. Invited Philip Nazarellis, Attorney City Solicitor and, and or his designee. Larry, could you ask the attorney to come in, Attorney Nazarella? Thank you. Good evening, Attorney. <laughs> attorney, do you have a, uh, we're on agenda item number eight, which is relative to the right control of evictions in manufactured housing, mobile home communities in Brockton. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> First of all, who, who, who filed this? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilor Sadisky and I have both worked on this together, but I believe my colleague okay. formally about it. I just didn't know. Okay, thank you. I, I understand this is a home rule petition. I'm not sure what the specific um, inquiry or concern would be. I do know that it has not been done in the city of Brockton before. This would be of uh, first impression whether or not we can do it, what we expect to uh, gain by doing it, but it is a uh, home rule petition. And I guess it's within the, uh, the favor of the city council if they want to move in that direction. Thank you. Councilor Stanetsky. The people at the Skyview uh, Homes down the south end. Main Street, correct. They're the ones who, who approached me on, and I was, was approached only on the, uh, the rent control item. Uh, they think it ex it's exorbitant every year that there's no control over the people who own the property. They own the home, but they lease the property, and that the property goes up at whatever rate they want it to go up at, and they would like to see some control, something to make it palatable and make it livable for them. So that's why I put this in, and I know that there are two locations in Easton that have already done this. Well, I just think the, it takes a lot of deliberation by the city council in going down this road. If we don't freeze and control the, the, the property tax on the raw land, and yet you want to tell the landlord to control the increase in rental, I think there's a little bit of a difference there. But that's, again, I haven't explored this. I wasn't quite sure what the city council was looking for. Uh, on this matter, I'll be happy to work with the council, investigate any inquiries, uh, and go forward. But as I said, it's a first impression. We haven't done it in Brockton, so whatever specific issues council may have, I'll be more than pleased to work with you on it. 
Well, I would make a motion, but I give my colleague a chance because he was very interested in the eviction part of it, I believe. Councilor. Uh, Councilor Stewart. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Yeah, so I think what we're saying is that the increases are sporadic and exorbitant, and um, the residents feel as if they have no recourse, and the increases are well beyond the normal tax increases that are levied for that property. Uh, and as my colleague mentioned, this has been done in other communities, including Easton. And um, so in terms of deliberation with um, this body in your office, I, I do appreciate the fact that it's a home rule petition. What is what is the typical course of action for a home rule petition? Well, it, it go through the legislature, but what concerns me, uh, of, of paramount uh, issue right now, is if this went through to protect those particular units, and units of similar nature uh, arose in other areas of the city, would it also cover them as well? Are we going to continue this patent with all other uh, properties? Well, I think the so just limited to these particular properties or that type of property. So I, so, I don't know what door opening and in, in, you know, you, there's going to be a general rule protecting that type of property wherever they may emerge in the city. That's my thinking. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So in terms of further deliberation, what is the typical course of action, Mr. Chairperson? Council on Home Rule Petition, we need to take a formal vote. Uh, we would then need to get um, send it up to the state house. We need to get our legislative body to work with legal counsel from the house side and the senate side. Uh, and then, uh, typically, in my experience, because I've done this in another municipality, you get a lot of changes from both councils because the house and senate don't always agree. And then, when there's a final vote, uh, if it's accepted from the state legislature, it would go up to the governor uh, relative to the home rule petition itself. So there's a, a lot of time involved. A lot of time. Um, and I, and I think um, one thing that we need to make sure is if a municipality like Easton did this, did they just do the rent control or was the eviction baked in? So I think we need to speak to their town attorney. That would be helpful, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, our legislative council, Attorney Gil Day, would need to probably work on this a little further. But really, the first step council is for the legislative body locally, us, the council, to take a vote, either yay or nay, if we want to even take the next step relative to a potential home rule petition. And I've also conferred with Attorney Gil Day about the whole process, as, as exactly at, uh, as Councilor Sullivan indicated. Um, so he would be well equipped to advise Council on what direction you should go on that basis. But I think it would commence by whether or not that's the direction you want to go into. So maybe we should, uh, maybe I should motion to postpone, table this until the next um, FinCom meeting and have some time internally to work through those details. Gus, I wouldn't table it, I'd continue it. Continue it, I'm sorry, yeah. yes. Second. Motion made by Councilor Stewart, properly set. You okay, Councilor Stensky, with that? Was that okay with to that? To table, not to continue? No, to continue. Are you to fine continue. with that? I, I have, Motion yes. made, properly second to continue. Uh, this agenda item number eight until the FinCom in August. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed, motion carries. We're going to continue that until August the 3rd, uh, Monday in August. Thank you, Attorney. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, we've already done 9, 10, and 11. Those were all continued as well. And we'll go to number 12 now, please. Resolved that the city's CFO confer with the assessor's department and get a full accounting by year of any and all funds from reserve for abatements and assessment accounts that may be made available. Invited John A. Conant, Chief Financial Officer, Paul Sullivan, Chairman, Assessors. Again, Councilors, Mr. Sullivan's on vacation. He did give us written notice relative to that. Uh, Mr. Condon, thank you, sir. Good evening, Councilors. I, I believe at the last Finance Committee meeting, uh, Paul Sullivan provided a list of the uh, overlay accounts and what was uh, what was pending on all of them. So I'm Mr. Not President. What the question would be. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Conant. Council Dubois. I, I filed this and, and Mr. Sullivan did supply us with the list. Um, so I would just really like to be able to review it and then maybe have him come in in August if it makes sense for his schedule. So if we could postpone until August and if it makes sense for his schedule, do it then. Otherwise, maybe we'll push it till September. But Move for to now, continue. I, yes, please. Move to continue and I second. 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 Motion made probably second to continue agenda item number 12 to the, to the only FENCOM we have on August the 3rd, Monday. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed. It's continued. Uh, Madam Clerk, number 13, please. Thank you, Mr. Condon. Resolved that the Mayor, Superintendent of Utilities, and members of the Water Commission be invited to appear before a committee of this council to discuss the rates charged for water in the city. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Larry Raleigh, Acting Commissioner DPW, Ozzie Jordan, Chairman Brockton Water Commission. <coughs> Councilors, we also have uh, Water Commissioner Kate Archett here as well tonight. Uh, and we, of course, the chair, Mr. Jordan. Good evening, Mr. Jordan. And we have 
And I don't think we actually uh, congratulated the acting commissioner. Larry, congratulations on your position of acting commissioner. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, counselors. We have been before you a few times on uh, trying to have a rate uh, put into, into motion. And we figured this year uh, we're thinking about 32%. What that equates to, I'll get it right, right to the meat of everything, equate to roughly uh, $128 a year, divide that by four, and around $32 per quarter. That would put us where we need to be uh, as far as all those things we've discussed. If you want, I'll go through all that, but I think you've heard it a number of times. Councilors, any questions for the chair of the Water Committee? Councilor uh, Monahan. Uh, yes, good evening, Mr. Jordan. Okay, again, could you just um, just explain to us fully why you feel that we need an increase, increase in the, in the, at this time? Everything that that increase could cover. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we want to go there. As much, well as you can. I mean, <laughs> why, I can why, do why, why do we need this Cap increase? We haven't done capital in what? Uh, six years? Four years, four years. Any capital improvements that we need to do across the city. Uh, we've had a, a number of councilors have talked about certain streets, certain problems with water on those streets, uh, the cost of doing that. We've got to a point that we're almost on a standstill on any of the general improvements that we were doing because the money just isn't there, period. Uh, what we we're afraid of one of these days is to wake up and have, have a major problem and not have either the staff, the equipment, supplies, et cetera, to carry this out. Uh, so we're not just talking, you know, the general leaks. Uh, we don't want another, another problem like we did with the meters. And that went on for years. Uh, and by the way, we are doing a couple other things, a master plan, some other stuff that we're trying to put into motion. And the meters themselves, we're putting part of the master plan would be make sure that those are updated so we don't ever run into that problem again. I think we're down around about 155 meters that need to be worked on right now. Um, minor things, the, the transmission on how they're transmitted, uh, a couple of them that just might be bad, that kind of a situation. But we're pretty, oh, in a few houses, I think it's around 55, I think it is, that we can't gain entry. So, you know, this all takes the cost of, of our folks uh, to do certain things. And quite often, if we do have any breaks, it's a lot of overtime we're, we're um, having to use to, to have a crew or a couple of crews come in and, and, and take care of that work. That's just lightly. Uh, I, I don't recall, there were, actually, uh, Mr. Raleigh, could you come forward, please? Where are we as far as, uh, Upgrading the system as far as new main and what have you. There was any, there was no money in the budget for uh, main replacement, if I remember correctly. No, it, it, it's been the last four years, council, is that we haven't been able to maintain or upgrade the the infrastructure in the city or the water treatment plant itself. Now, the water treatment itself, in itself, runs 24/7, just like the system does. So you can only let it go so long before something's going to break. So that's why we're asking for this increase, to start <coughs> maintaining not only the infrastructure, but the water treatment plant, so we don't get in any, in any difficulty, especially with, with the residents of Brockton and the regulators. Okay, Mr. Conn, thank you, thank you. Don't forget, the system runs 24-7. That's right, well, I- It never <laughs> stops. Exactly, exactly right. And what is your feeling on these, this increase, Mr. Conn? Do you think this is a... I think you need a rate increase. I have for several years. Uh, the, the size of it, I think they've probably pro properly sized the amount that's needed. The phasing of that, whether you do it in one year or a couple of years, I think you know, the sooner you do it, the sooner you'll get the, uh, the money into the system. With respect to spending the money, they'd have to come back with a request for an appropriation because the budget is set on the present revenue. So whatever new spending would take place would be up to the city council to, uh, to approve. Right. So we haven't the had- The amount of money is not significant for your average user. Uh, I mean, the percentages sound high, but for your average user, it isn't a lot of money. Because as Ozzie said, it's like 120 bucks or something for, for about 30%. So our infrastructure right now, we haven't put new main in the ground for four years? Yes. We've been basically on no capital spending 
uh, of any significance for four years. And I think, um, what was it, a couple months ago we had um, some, the gentleman from Ward, uh, Councilor Dubois' ward came in with the, with the problems up in his ward, with that mean, which yeah, those probably problems only get, That's right. Those problems only get fixed with investment in the pipes right. under the Can ground. I mean, that's, key. that's the problem. Right. Okay. So well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Councilors, uh, I, I forgot to say, uh, Water System Manager Brian Credence here as well. And let's just be clear because I know a lot of the elected officials here uh, were getting calls today and emails today. We are not taking a vote tonight right. on the water rates. Right. We're not doing that. It's a resolve to discuss what the Water Commission is proposing. I just want everybody to understand that. Thank you. Uh, we uh, have Councilor DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Evening. Uh, all right, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, we have an enterprise account for the sewer in the water. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. How much do we take in and what is the enterprise account reading right now? What do you take in for revenue in a year? Mr. Connor, you know that? Did you? Our budget right now is 15, we, and that's what we get in, is 15. Okay, so you're running 15 and the we're, deficit we're, is 15. Yes. So, okay, so. 15 million, right? Yes. 15 million, yeah. yeah. I, I, no, okay, sorry, 15 million. Well, I, I know it wasn't 15 cents. So. <laughs> 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 All right, and now you're looking for a, a, a a proposed increase, we're not raising water rates, folks, that you're asking the average user, what, 120 bucks a year, you said? 128 a year, uh, um, oh, 30, I believe it's 32 a quarter. Okay, that's for the average user who uses less than 5,000 cubic feet in a month, right? No. Or a quarter. What's an average user? 12,000. 12,000 per quarter? Yes. Mr. Creedon, good evening. And mainly yourselves, your own accounts. And the quarterly taking your last May bill. Who's the one you didn't? That's the question. <laughs> uh, we don't want to know that. That, that counselor will know, knows who he is. Uh, <laughs> the, he's not on the water system. He uses a well. All right. Well. Uh, the, that counselor is he, so everybody knows who it is. Okay. Thank you. The, the range of increase per quarter for your May bill went from $2.30 up to $8. And this is counting everybody in here. I also looked at a couple of three families. The two three families were an increase per quarter of $30 for the entire three family. All right. So it ranges on the number of... Uh, people use. You know your own homes. Majority, you're in single families, okay, and I also included my own, my own house in that. The, it will range. Now, my, my bill will go up if it's 10%. <clears throat> it could go up probably 10 to $15 in the summer because you use more water in the summer, mm -hmm. all right? I'm taking the May bill, which is the actual bills. I actually have it broken down if anybody would like to have a copy of what the what their bill would be, looking at it at 10 percent. 10 percent is uh, an increase that is, yes, sizable because we haven't had even, a, we didn't have, the last rate increase was in 2008 and the capitals ended two years later because we ran out of money. We didn't have any money to the capitals. Mr. Rowley is undermanned, understaffed. We've, we've laid off uh, six to eight men in, the last, in those last six years too because we're dealing with other costs, uh, you know, not too obvious, but that, that, that Aquaria contract we have also supplies us with water so that at this time of the year when all the towns around us are going to water bin, we're not even looking at that. The rate increase covers our costs. Our costs have affected capitals, they've affected our manpower, and they also affected our uh, what we owe to the general fund, whereas we're still paying back to the general fund, all right, for employee costs that occurred over the last year or so. So that is a very brief summary of And a, a large user, uh, uh, it is not an extraordinary amount. I can, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't look at any particular industry, uh, but 
a 10 percent increase per quarter is probably, you're looking at a three family, right? We all know the three family as three families in the house. That is only $30. Well, I mean, a large user would be uh, your hospitals. Your hospitals. Okay, you have yeah, they, they some would, of the manufacturing plants in Brockton. They'd be affected in, in relative. And I, I, again, I could I can sit down and take their bill and-, and No, and no, I understand it. that, but, but I mean- in, Coming in here, I knew I had 11 people in front of me, so I looked at 11 people I had here. I even looked at the mayor's uh, so former yeah. residence. So you, right. you came up with this formula to go up on the uh, on a, a proposed increase yes. on the rates, uh, on the on the right. on the infrastructure that we have to do certain things within the city right. over the next few years. Correct. I mean, it's it's. I've used this example before. Any one of us that have a home, you wouldn't sit there for six years and do nothing to it. You know the kinds of problems that we would bring. But yet we're asking us here in the city to do that. We have to have the dollars to implement that. And, you know, this falls with the, the public, you know, safety part, not just fire. You know, let this whole group wake up one morning, there's no water in your house. Then what? I'd be calling you. Just don't shower. No, I'd be in the same <laughs> problem. So, you know, unless I know before and I can fill my tub, but that's not going to last too long. <laughs> So, I mean, this is, it's serious. It really is. And that's the kind of thing that we want to make sure because it, it, it affects everything that we deal with. If you can remember a few years back, because, because of Aquaria, we couldn't do certain things, okay, or lack of Aquaria because of the drought. We don't have that problem at the moment. But we, we want to maintain this system, and it costs money to do that. And that's all we're saying. And the longer we wait, the more it's going to go up. So next time, instead of maybe talking for 32, maybe it's 42 or whatever it may be. So again, um, I'm not trying to do a scare tactic here, but we know what happened with the meters. A number of times came, I wasn't involved then, a few of you might have been around, time after time coming before the council to get money to fix that problem. And until it blew up, that's when we fixed it. We can't do that with the water. We cannot afford to do that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jordan, for Thank your you. information. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Council Bonds, followed by Council Cruz. Uh, yes, just um, for clarification, what's the rate now that you're raising it, or that you're proposing to raise it to 32? Just a clarification. Africa, 10 is it 10? Hmm. So for the, let's see, for 1,000, 320, yeah, the block rate for this, so the lowest would be 299 would be the present rate. Um, you want all of them? And then 329. Wait, I'm confused. You, you initially said that uh, the proposal was for 32%. So what was the, what's the current percentage? Percentage is, is 2.99. 2. Oh, so from no, 2.99 to 32? No. no, it's just an increase. <coughs> Councils, if there's no yes. objections, is there any objections to, uh, we have a commissioner here. Dan Murphy, the other commissioner, actually, I forgot to say this. He's out of state at a work conference. But we do have Commissioner Kate Archard as well, right. along with the, the chair. Yeah. Nobody objects. And, Go ahead, Ms. Archer. And may I also state that Kate looked at other cities and towns, and I would like her to speak about that. Also. Thank okay. you. Um, and this is new to me, and I'm learning this as well. So we have a graduated block rate. So when you use a certain volume, it's at one block. You use more volume, it's an, at another block, and so on. Okay. The larger volumes are, are uh, rated at a higher block because people that are pulling more cause more stress on the system, so we ask them to pay a little bit more. Right. So right now, most homeowners are at the 1251 to 2500 uh, cubic feet block, which is $3.81. At the 10% increase, they'd be paying $4.19 instead of that $3.81. And so by the time you're done with what the average homeowner is going to, and again, you have to have some kind of a comparison, it works out to about um, $10 a quarter at, on the high end. Most people are going to see between $3, $3 and $10 a quarter. So that's, you know, 3 3 or $4 a month 
extra uh, of the bill. And again, it all depends on your usage. If you're not using a lot, you're not going to have to go up a lot. And we understand with the businesses that are using a lot of water, 10% is a lot to them. But again, cost of living goes up 2.5% every year. It's been six years since we've asked for more money, and all the cost for chemicals to treat water has gone up, cost for pipes have gone up, and we haven't been bringing in that extra revenue. So that's why when he said 30%, right now we're saying let's do 10% this year, 10% next year, and 10% the year after. We're already behind in terms of what we've collected. And again, it's up to you what you ultimately want to do, but doing nothing is what, you've, uh, what the city council has done for six years. So Okay, so approving this, if and when it comes forward, um, the agreement would be that it would be implemented over a three-year period? Well, we're just going to do one year for 10% and then revisit it. It depends on, on you know. The revenue of that year? Yeah. Okay. And um, it's up to the council to how you feel about that. And as a commission, speak to us about that. I mean, that's, you know, why we deliberate. Okay. We and, make a um, recommendation and you, you act on, on that. Okay. And is there any mechanism that um, guarantees the funds to go to these important projects that you mentioned, like the capital improvement or anything? Or, or can well, we it's, it, it is up to the, to the mayor and to Mr. Condon and to the DPW commissioner. They put out a budget and they allocate amounts of money for that. And you, have, you had before you a budget that had no capital improvements. You could speak to that, but as a, from what I understand, as a city council, you can't add things into the budget. So, you know, that is why staying in touch with your, the mayor and staying in touch, you know, to make sure those projects are put in the budget, yes, we need you to be advocates for that, to, to have that happen. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Archard. I appreciate it. Uh, Council Cruz, Council Stewart, thank you. then Council Dubois. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Atchard. Um, in fact, uh, I think my first year on the Council, we had to do an increase, and it hadn't been done for about 10 years. And I advocated then we should do, we had to do a major increase, and instead of doing increments, which we should be doing. Um, Jay, let me ask you a question. Uh, and it may not, you may not have the answer to this, but one of the things that drives me crazy about the fact that we do this is, for instance, uh, and Brian mentioned it, the enterprise account was short, what, not this last fiscal year, the year before, correct? So, uh, so the city fund, uh, they could not pay their whole. The, the enterprise fund didn't have enough revenues to take care of all of the things that wanted to take care of. And the shortage ended up being in a lack of appropriations for capital and a lack of appropriation to the city budget, the general fund budget, to pay for costs that the general fund pays for the enterprise fund. So basically, we had to use general fund money to subsidize this account. Yes. The taxpayers, which are all inside the city of Brockton, pay that. Yes. The rate payers are not all inside the city of Brockton, are they? No, and there's, a little, there's not the same group. That's true. So we allow the rate payers to get a free skate by not doing this, and basically the taxpayers end up paying subsidizing that because we refuse to, to raise this the way it should be. And if there were a major catastrophe, 12 inch main or whatever is coming up from, from, uh, from Hanson collapsed, how do we pay for that? The, um, depending on the size of the problem, there is an ordinance uh, capital reserve for the sewer and water department for emergencies like that. I think it's about a million dollars in it. So if it was a million dollar problem, you'd have a million dollars to apply to it. If it was a bigger problem than a million dollars, uh, you'd probably need to get an emergency borrowing authorization through. Uh, and that borrowing authorization would then, because then you have to pay the debt service on it the next year, you either have a greater subsidy coming from the taxpayers, which you haven't got the money to do, or you'd need a rate increase at that point to pay for it. So I, I think uh, Ms. Archer has correctly stated the problem. The best way to go about this is to have a systematic approach to putting proper rates in place and then to put in front of the council the spending on that revenue through appropriations for the capital spending so that you get to say yay or nay to those projects. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, we, I, I don't know why we haven't done it in the past. I've advocated for it. Um, you have to pay what you, you pay for what you use. Yeah, and I think if the council were uh, raising these rates in a small amount on a periodic basis, 
uh, the, dis the decision wouldn't be as difficult as to wait and then to have to bigger, do a bigger rate increase. Correct. Because we, we know that we're, we, we're not in control of those costs. We can't control the chemical costs. We can't control the power costs. The labor is the other piece. But th that's a big part of that budget. And then we're, we're stuck with uh, shrinking capital because the revenues aren't adequate to keep up with those expenses. So. And we're, without those capital, capital expenditures, we've got pipes and the, through use are just going just gonna to be getting worse and worse. The homeowner ends up with a poorer service, but we can't. Well, there's nothing we can do about it unless we unless we do the rate increase. Unless you replace replace the pipes. When I first came to work for the city, there were problems in terms of unaccounted for water. A lot of the water was leaking out of the pipes into the ground. Also, discolored water. A lot of places in the city were getting brown water because the pipes were so old. Over the years, in the first 15 to 20 years I was here, with rate increases, those problems were addressed, and a lot of them were fixed. But now we're moving back in the wrong direction. I think. And just one last comment to Mr. Rowley, a question for Mr. Rowley. Just throw a percentage number at me. Repair versus maintenance, be proactive maintenance as opposed to repair. How much more does that cost you? As far as... I mean, pipes, you know, pipes go down, they have to be fixed. I mean, uh, just to do Council of Dubois Ward and, and Council of Annapolis, um, you, you're probably looking at $30 million to, to upgrade the, all the pipes in, that, in those two wards. Right, and we're not going to be doing all of that, but if we had been through the years systematically doing a little bit each year, we'd be nowhere near in, in, in as bad a shape, would we? No, no, not that we are now, but we will never catch up. It's no, I understand we're going. that, but... It's just like that vicious circle that it, it's just once we get done with A and then Z has to get Start all over again. It's running around with band-aids, isn't it? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Not only that, it, 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 in, it, it's the, a lot of the streets that are, are in disrepair, too, especially in 5 and 6. I mean, and there's no sense. We're going to talk to you about that. Uh, <laughs> am I, I just, so we really shouldn't repair the roads, which isn't fair to the residents or your constituents because, is just as bad as the top looks. The bad, the underneath is bad also. So we should. It's like a, a building a house. You got to build a foundation first and work your way up. I don't want to pave some of these streets, and then I could, you know, my crew could be in there the next day. The hot top's not even um, dry yet, and we're putting a hole down. So it's streets, pipes. It's 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 a lot. And with this, if we do get this increase, then maybe we can start. I know I promised Council to watch Tina Rav years ago, but we ran out of money. Now we have Norwich Road, and Tory we have Street. Tory Street that has to get done. Tory Street, just to do Tory Street, it's about three and a half million dollars. So I think, and to answer your question, Council of Bonds, is, is um, when we do get this capital money in the budget, we can prioritize the streets that we have to get done. That's how it goes, and that would come under, under um, I would talk it over with the mayor, and Jay and myself, we make a decision on that, just like we do the road uh, management, pavement. That's how, that's how it would be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What information, Mr. Condon? I just had a question for you. Just to, to follow up on that question, if there's a rate increase, the dollar amount can be used at the discretion of the mayor. I mean, there's a rumor that if there's a water rate increase, it could be used for one year for the schools. I mean, that's permissible under the law, correct? It would be because the, the, um, uh, the Water Enterprise Fund last year failed, failed to pay about a million and a half dollars of general fund costs that were due to it. But it would take an appropriation to do that, Council, so the mayor couldn't simply move that money. But it is, it is, when people it is water, permissible. it's not necessarily going to be used for water 100%. It, that doesn't have to be. Well, it, that, that, that's true. Every year's water budget has a reimbursement to the general yep. fund for such things as health costs and pension costs for the, for the water workers. Okay. Thank you, sir. It takes appropriation, though, Council. Yep, it does. Thank you. Council Stewart. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rowley, a uh, question around. So the 10% represents, if you could remind me, how much money is that annually? I believe that's going to be a little over a million dollars for the year. Million, about a million and a half. Okay. Uh, so I, I try my best to be reasonable around requests from departments, but I would say that uh, in this case, I can never see myself approving or advocating for and possibly even lobbying against an increase in, in, in water fees until I see something out of your department that talks about how this operation is going to be reformed. I've, 
been totally unhappy with the management of DPW, as you probably have guessed. I don't think that's a big secret. And so until I see uh, from your department what reforms you guys plan to put in place to ensure that um, the operation is more accountable, uh, I can never see myself voting for a, a nickel increase for the department. So you're the, you're the acting commissioner. I don't know what your responsibilities entail, but I would say if you're looking to gain my support for any kind of increase, I'd like to see some kind of plan come out of your department of how you plan to operate more efficiently. That's just my public statement to you. So I've, I've you, made that statement privately to the mayor as well. Okay. Are you looking for a long-term plan from the DPW, or are you looking? I, I don't understand. What are you looking for, a Councilor? Right. Uh, well, I just I think uh, just from my experiences on the council, I have not has been very unclear to me what what are the goals of the DPW of the coming years. Um, Councilor, what, you can follow a resolve on that, not to cut you off. But really, the only scope of the resolve is the water rates. And you've only been acting for, what, last week? Last two weeks. So yeah. if Council still wants to file a resolve to have you in in that capacity to talk, I think that's appropriate. Right. But, and I understand what you're saying, Councilor, but this is really a resolve filed by Monaghan, right, Councilor? Relative mm -hmm. to the water rates, right? Cruz. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Cruz. Okay, thank you. Right. So in terms of, so we're speaking about the water rates, and so it, we, I can follow up with the resolve and we can have that conversation, but uh, we're talking about whether or not we're going to support an increase uh, as part of what the increase happens to be. And so I just wanted to make it clear that my, you know, my sort of very low floor in terms of supporting an increase is to have some kind of document from your department explaining next steps for this department. And I can file a resolve and be more clear about that and maybe you and I can have a conversation sure. um, I, offline as well. Yes, I okay. would like that. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor uh, Dubois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be quick. Um, I first want to just appreciate uh, at-large Councilor Stewart for his words, um, both as a colleague and as a resident. I really appreciate what he said and I agree with it. But um, Ward 6 has some of the worst pipes in the city. It also has some of the worst roads in the city. And minus um, acting Superintendent Rowley, who I have the utmost respect for, the same group of people allocated zero dollars from this year's Chapter 90 money toward six roads, the worst roads in the city by an independent audit. Zero dollars of Chapter 90 money came toward six this year, the first time since I've been a city councilor. So the idea that I'm going to trust these same people to take citizens' money, a lot of it being from people in Ward 6, and just give us the big heave ho. It, it, you, you have to prove something to me. And this year is the first year zero dollars are coming in towards six for road repair. It's unacceptable. I have a huge number of taxpayers that pay in and are the reason that this money is coming into the city. And the mayor and the CFO and the previous superintendent allocated zero dollars towards six. Zero dollars. <throat> so thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the Water Commission. I mean, I appointed two members in the capacity, and they're two very good members, and Mr. Creedon has attested to that as well. Uh, but Mr. Hassan and Mr. Jordan are also uh, doing a great job. So we have a good group of people there right now, and I think Larry Rowley is a, a good selection. Um, but $128 is a lot of money to people in Brockton. It really is. Uh, I mean, when you're talking about people, specifically the seniors that live on fixed incomes, you say 128 bucks, I mean, you know, that's a, a nice pair of shoes, but $128 is a lot of money to people. It really, really is. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to support this, but I'm only one of 11. But I just wanted to go on record saying I really appreciate what Mr. Creedon does and all the water commissioners because uh, it's about time that we have some people in there that are really delving in and, uh, and working hard. So with that, I want to just say thank you. And back to you, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else entertain a motion? Motion. I do just one more thing. Um, Good morning, Ian. And I, th well, where I work in the utility business, I see, and actually when I do dig safes, and I do a lot in Brockton, every morning, every day of the week, three, four, five emergencies we have to go to for water breaks in the city. That's not one every other day, it's every single day. So we're talking a lot of infrastructure problems. A lot of main problems, service problems. There's a lot of work that the water department does every day. And then when they have, if we have to go to an emergency at 1 in the morning for a water main break, their, their staff is so short that they have to put 
three or four foremen out there getting paid overtime at a foreman's rate. So the costs just keep continually build up and build up and build up. And if your infrastructure is not taken care of, even though it would be at a slow pace, you're going to be paying, you know that commercial, pay me now, pay me later? You wait till you've got to pay later. It's going to be a lot worse. Maintaining, like in everything else in your home, whatever you want to do, has to be done. We're not talking about this money being frivolously used. We're talking about a rate increase that is going to, is for the benefit of the whole city. It's going to keep it, or try to keep up with new, new mains and what have you, and keep, give the, city, uh, the citizens a good product, good water. There's, a, there's a, lot, a lot of things that will go into this, and I don't think that's really a lot of money. I mean, I'm, it could be for a lot of people, maybe $128 is over a whole year. So you spread that out. It could be you know, a lot for some people, but I think we really have to pay for what we use as citizens. And I, and actually, Ms. Archard, Mrs. Archard, I think you told me that. Didn't you look into the rates of other cities and towns of where the Broughton actually stood? Did you have something on that? Um, and again, $128 in a lump sum is a lot, but that's less than a dollar a day. Um, so it, I think people, and for water, water is not free anymore. Yeah, Brockton is at about $36.92 for a monthly um, rate. So again, 10% a month is about $3.62 or whatever, 69 cents. So again, $3 a month is, you know, it, it might seem a lot, but it, I don't think it is a lot for water, especially when you're talking about pipes and other things. In other communities, um, we have Holbrook is at 51 a month, Abington is at 51, Weymouth is at 50, um, Quincy is at 50, uh, East Bridgewater is at 48, again, Brockton is at 36. So I sent you folks a package. I really, um, as the citizen rate payer representative, I did not want to go up, but at the same time, when you own a home or when you rent and things break, you have to fix them, and it costs money to fix things. And um, Councillor Stewart, to your point, as a, a new commissioner, it is the Water Commission's charge to justify what we're doing with the rate money th that we collect, and we are we're going to be working on a plan. I plan on taking that um, very expensive audit that was done by the Abrams Group mm -hmm. and going point by point to see where that's been done, and we will produce um, you know, our, a master plan and a document to show what we plan on doing. So um, hopefully that will, will help you feel more comfortable with collecting the money, but, it, you know, we've got to fix what's broken. I appreciate that. And Ms. Archer, just to, to state again, to, to clarify my position, I'm not necessarily opposed to an increase, but I do want to see where the department is taking seriously Absolutely. the reforms before I can Absolutely. ever support it. That's our charge to do that. So. And also, I think, uh, next, I think in the next council meeting, um, the in. Water the Commission put forward a ordinance for an irrigation meter. Possibly, if you want to speak about that for a second, do you mind, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yeah, we can, we can do that because I know Mr. Creedon has been concerned about it, so absolutely. Okay. So again, we're, we're asking ratepayers to pay, but we're also looking for ways that we can save money for ratepayers. And currently, people that want to water their lawns and their gardens and use water like that, they're being charged sewer on top of that. We don't think that's fair, so we want to make sure that people are getting the value. If they're, pay if they're using water alone, they should just be paying for water alone. And so we're going to fight for those kinds of savings. We're going to look for users on the system that aren't paying their bills and to collect those kinds of things as well. So we're, we're trying our best to bring in monies that will help pay. But you had Mr. Gorekas, I think his name was, or Gorekas, he came in here and you saw pictures of, of brown water. and. Oh, you know, it, it, that's not going to change. So if, if, if you, you know, you're going to do something for your constituents, you're going to have to um, um, collect the fees to fix the broken system. Thank you, Council. I mean, thank you, Council. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Archie. <laughs> Commissioner, Commissioner. Thank Council you, Yaneri. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I might, um, and before we go on, I don't know, somebody mentioned that we we're going to talk about the irrigation situation, but I think that's a, a, a you know, should be held for another date and time, not for tonight. That's a different issue altogether. But uh, Councilor, then, just a brief summary, Councilor. Just a brief summary. Yeah, keep it brief. Um, I did, Councilor. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. In any case, uh, I'm still totally not sold on on this um, water rate increase myself because I'm concerned um, for the fact that it probably will not all go back to what we really wanted to do. 
And I think, um, I think as Mr. Condon mentioned, I mean, you know, the mayor would come in and make his own appropriation in regards to, you know, wanting to move some of the monies around based upon what the revenue would be in the, in the course of the year. Um, first, I do want to thank uh, Mr. Creedon for doing an assessment of all our homes and, and just so it is out publicly, yes, I do have well water. Um, but remember, there's a cost to having a well as well. And believe me, if you want a gold meter Lowe's tomorrow and pick up the 40 pound bags of salt, sedative that I need at $8.90, please come with me, Mr. Creedon, because the 40 pounds is a little hard on my shoulder to be truthful with you. So I just want everybody to understand that. It, it, it's nice to have a well that came with the house. Believe me, I don't have time to dig a well. Trust me. In any case, in any case, and I, and I too also agree with some of the comments other councils have, have made in regards to the cost because I firmly believe as well and, and living in, you know, being in Ward 3 and being the representative there for several years, I do have a lot of older people within the ward, and Ms. Archer knows that as well. And those people complain to me every day about different things that go up in the city, whether it be taxes, uh, whether it be even their excise tax on their vehicle, or whether it even be uh, water rates. It, it does make a very um, concern that I have to whether or not I want to see an increase unless I can sell to them that it's going to go back and do what it should do to help them with water situations. I have streets as well in water. We all have problem with streets and water pipes within each ward, not just certain ones. I know there are some wards that have some difficulties, but we all have the same situation and we deal with it each and every day. And I'll tell you, you know, again, there's no rate increase before us this evening. And we need to make that clear. Unless somebody here from the council, and I think that's how it works, the council has to put in for that to take place, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Condon. The mayor's not going to. No mayor has never done it that I've, since I've been sitting here, so it has to come from a councillor. It's an ordinance change, councillor. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and I don't foresee where that's happening right now. So, you know, until that happens, then I'll, I'll deal with the situation at hand. But I'm still, not, I'm still not sold on it. And... I'd still like to see, I agree with some of the comments Councilor Stewart made, I'd want to see just what we're going to do with um, some of that extra revenue when it does come into place. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, we had a motion, right? Yeah. It was properly seconded, right? Was it seconded? Second. Second. Motion made properly seconded. Favorable recommendation back to full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Madam Clerk, number 14, please. Resolved that the representatives of the Department of Public Works be invited to appear before a committee of this council to discuss the possibility of implementation of uniform trash barrows. Invited Craig Young, Superintendent of Operations, Patrick Sullivan, Recycling Coordinator. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, I uh, filed this resolve. Um, I had a resident uh, contact me, and thank you to gentlemen for appearing today, who had a specific issue around. Um, having a rat problem in her neighborhood and, and credited some of that problem, not all of it, to the fact that trash barrels are left uncovered. Uh, and it sparked a deeper conversation around how do we ensure the quality of life in neighborhoods and dealing directly with, with the rodent issues, but also cleanliness and trash being thrown around because of winds and things like that. And also looking at the issue of um, just a, a neat appearance throughout the city by creating a uniform system. And so we know that this system exists in other cities, including Somerville. Uh, I was driving through uh, Randolph and Avon, and they all have uniform systems. Um, and I know there are some costs associated with it. But at the same time, I know our vendors are very interested in putting a system in place for their own benefit. And so maybe their, the, the cost concerns we may have can be uh, negotiated because there's interest on the other side. So I wanted to bring you guys in to kind of talk through what the possibilities are, what a time frame could be, uh, and what work you've probably already done to move us in that direction. Okay, thank you, Counselor. Uh, as you might know, we, ooh, okay. um, as you might know, we, we have been studying this for a few months now, and Counselor Azak, uh, I, she accompanied me to a, a regional meeting where uh, uh, Weymouth, Abington, and Plymouth just went over. Uh, Bridgewater went over. Pretty much all of our butters are on a uh, on an automated system at this point. the The appearance is is excellent. The aesthetics are great. Uh, for Brockton, though, however, the one of the uh, the concerns that our our current hauler has, where we've had pay as you throw since two thousand and one, our trash volumes are very low, and so going to an automated system for our vendor. 
uh, they're not really going to save anything. Usually when they go to a town, say like Bridge, uh, well not Bridgewater, let's say uh, uh, Weymouth, they were letting you put out whatever you want. They still weren't pay as you throw. So when they went to a, a 64 gallon trash toter, uh, now the new law in Weymouth is you put whatever can fit in here, that's all the trash you get. So their tonnage is going to go way down. It's a big benefit to the, to the hauler. So the hauler is willing to purchase those barrels for the city because they're going to save money in the end on the tip fees. Uh, Brockton isn't really in that position because our trash is very low compared to the cities around us anyway per person because of our pay as you throw. So the bottom line right now where we're two and a half years into a five and a half year contract is that if we make any changes right now it would cost money. We would have to pay um, uh, either through renegotiating the contract right now or some way for these containers, which are about $50 a piece, so it's $100 per resident, uh, we would also, because Allied hadn't planned on it, have to compensate them for retrofitting their trucks so that the automated arm can come out and grab those barrels. Um, any, uh, you know, any other costs associated with it. Pretty much Allied doesn't have a reason to negotiate with us right now. They're right in the middle of this contract. So, in my opinion, it's a great system and it's probably going to come just because that's the way the industry is going. But I think in two years or so, when we go to negotiate this, uh, we're going to, all of a sudden you're going to see prices drop because now we're negotiating waste management once in or ABC once in or these different, everyone's going to be offering us a better deal and I think at that time, we can probably get what we want without having to raise the fees or, or maybe lower the fees or who knows. But I think if we make a move right now, um, we're going to end up raising our costs. And if we wait two years, I don't think we will. So that's just my two cents on, on the matter after doing some study. Um, uh, you know, the council could probably decide to do whatever you want if you want us to keep pursuing it. and and uh, work on, on getting something in place as soon as possible. Uh, we could probably look into that, but I just don't see a way that we're gonna uh, save money today doing it. And I know it's a good plan, Councillor. You know, you, you saw it, but, uh, but uh, that, that's the choice. We could pay a little more for better aesthetics right now or wait down the road. I see. Uh, I want to yield the floor for my colleagues who may have questions. And, and again, I know Councilor Aziak, uh, as you mentioned, went on a tour uh, with you as well. But um, I open up the floor, and then I may have some follow-up questions if my colleagues have questions. Council Monaghan, you have a question? Yeah, just Bonham, the other towns, they're allowed just one barrel that you couldn't put out and pay for an extra like plastic bag like we do? No, well, it depends on, not in Weymouth you couldn't. Um, some, some towns do. Some are like Randolph. Randolph's automated um, recycling only, but their trash is like ours. They mm -hmm. have a, you know, the pay as you throw. Or, that just uh, changed, Pat. That, that just changed, so they're automated trash now too? No, it used to be put out anything. Just it used to be put out ago. anything, and that, that's the way, uh, you know, a lot of towns, Brockton was very, we were the hundredth town to go pay as you throw out of 350 towns in, in the state. Some towns that never would have passed, never in a million years. And, um, and so now as these other communities are running into problems paying with trash, they have to do something. They can't convince the people to go pay bags like we do. Um, so they're coming up with this automated system. It just happens that the automated, you know, it looks really good, and, uh, and it's a way to just tell the, this is what you're going to do. This, you're getting this can. It's got your number on it, uh, and, and that's that. Whatever fits in that is it. Um, anything else, call the vendor directly. I know that's what Abington does. Uh, if you have a bulky items or something you want to get rid of, you have to make your own arrangements privately. So, um, you know, it, it does affect their volumes. It's, it's a way for them to control their volumes. They never had it before. A yeah. town like Plymouth never even had curbside service. So when they come in and they say, now a guy can come in front of your house and take your trash, they decide to start off with the automated right off the bat. 
Yeah, so you just have to make some type of a deal if you wanted to continue to put something out with them. I mean, yes. you always see, I don't know, yeah. you go through the city, you see it. You got a regular barrel and you see three or four green bags with two. I don't know if you're going to cut that down. That's going to be uh, kind of tough probably on a lot of people. Well, it would see the thing about it would also be tough on our uh, our income of our enterprise fund because the barrels are larger than the amount of trash we owe, so we'd lose all the pay as you throw income from the bags. Right. Because people would have more to throw away, um, and they the our department would lose that income. And anytime you lose it one where you got to grab it from somewhere else. Yeah. So um, in order to keep our rates stable, uh, you know. Uh, that's, we're trying to do that too. I just heard the last conversation from the last number, and, and I know if we can avoid raising fees for any reason at all, that's the most important thing, probably. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Monahan. Council Bonds? Uh, yes, the trucks that come around now. Yes. Um, say, for instance, if I were to buy one of those uniform, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> one of the uniform barrels with sure. the lid. Would they be able to take that from my house now? No, currently, currently they can't. <laughs> what they, oh, sorry. What they, what they would do, uh, those vehicles can be retrofitted. There's an arm that costs about $70,000 per truck or something, 60,000 or so. And it can come out and do the tipping, put it back. And those, they can be fitted onto the vehicles that Allied uses right now. Those trucks that they're using right now are less than a year old, though they, they be, they'll be a year old in September with the uh, compressed natural gas instead of diesel now to keep the air a little bit cleaner around here. Um, but those, those would all have to be retrofitted. And since we never negotiated anything like that in the contract, that's an extra cost we're ask, asking them to absorb. And uh, rightfully so, they're saying, well, we didn't, Agree to this, and, and we need them. We'll be glad to do it, but but we just don't have the funds. The way we set this up, you'll have to pay for it, and we'll do it for you. So for aesthetics, if I wanted to get rid of the barrels that I have, which are kind of beat up, mm -hmm. you know, got holes and everything, yeah. and I wanted to get that, they wouldn't take you that from get me that right now because we're limited to a 32-gallon barrel right now. That's the ordinance. Oh, okay. Those so are, you can't uh, get 60. a bigger one. That if, if people try that, you know, and that happens all the time, that's just part of enforcing uh, the ordinance. People do all of a sudden show up with those. We tag them okay. or else we have Ally just take one bag off the top and leave the rest of it. Don't okay. only take half of it. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions or you want to go? Oh, Council Isaac, I'm sorry. I just want to say thank you for being here tonight. and. Um, in a perfect world, we would all have, it really does make a difference, and I look forward to having them and whenever it's possible, so thank you. Okay, Council, I do too. They, they are nice. <laughs> thank you, Council. Council Stewart, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. So I, I think this is a great start to the conversation. Thank you for the work that you've been doing already, and it sounds to me that the plan is that your department will work steadily on researching this more and making this part of the possibly a part of negotiations moving forward to the next contract so the extra burden for the company isn't there and it's part of the deal. And that we would think through then what those limitations may be. So it could be the large barrel that's automated with an additional um, package that you can put out or something like that. So we want to make sure we tailor it in a way that works well for, for Brockton. I, I think it'll, it, it will happen, and I, but I think it's two years away. Honestly, and I think uh, then we'll have all kinds of options. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Okay, thank you, thank you Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Yeah. Take a motion. Take the motion to uh, send this favorably to the full city council. Second. Okay. Motion okay. made, properly seconded. Agenda item number 14, favorable recommendation back to full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Thank Young. You, thank you, Mr. Rowley. <laughs> Uh, before we conclude tonight, councilors, a couple uh, points of information. Again, just a reminder, special meeting is Wednesday night here, 7 o'clock in the chamber. We will have a, uh, we're in summer session. We will have a full city council meeting next Monday night at 8 o'clock, which is July 28th. This Thursday uh, at 7 o'clock at Campanelli, the Rocks are hosting the All-Star Game. It starts at 7 p.m. July 24th this Thursday. And on Saturday, this coming Saturday, 12 o'clock at Campanelli, is the John Walder Memorial Wiffle Ball Tournament. It's always a good take. It's for a really great cause, and John was a great guy. 
Um, so, is anybody else that has a personal privilege or anything like that? Mr. Chairman, if Counselor. I might, just a moment of personal privilege. I just want you to mention on Wednesday evening, uh, make sure it gets into the minutes that I will be unable to attend that meeting because of my work schedule. And I'm sure that um, I will have a conversation with you and you can bring me up to speed to just what that meeting is all about. Thank Completely you. We noted, Councilor. And one other thing, Councilor, I will tell Mr. Matta to come uh, to the FENCOM and again through the process. <laughs> At that time, I'll have to see if there's any objections or if everybody agrees to let the gentleman speak. But I just wanted to mention that. Anything else? Seeing none, this meeting's adjourned. Okay, so <clears throat>